for this public hearing. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. No speakers. Thank you very much. We're going to close the public hearing and Mr. Craig Howard would like to say something to us. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, before the council votes on this special appropriation, there are two suggested amendments um, that we received. The first was shared um, by Councilmember Reamer. And unless you would like to um, describe it, Councilmember Reamer, I'm, I'm happy to. Okay, so the first one it is included in the packet and it would amend the uh, resolution to also allow full funding of the three hour initiative at $500,000. This would result in $41,000 of this, um, of the appropriation going to MCEDC. And the reason is that the three hour initiative was funded by unused telework uh, expenditures. And at the time those expenditures were estimated, the un unused amount was estimated to be about $500,000. Um, in the final reconciliation, the, the total available funds from that were $459,000. So this $41,000 would just be to, um, to make that full $500,000 appropriation whole. And then the second amendment, which, which was distributed as the packet addendum last night, um, came from the county executive and they requested to add one more authorized use of the funding to, I'm turning to my sheet right here, um, to allow for $1.2 million that the county spent on the essential ch provider child care supplement program. Um, since the program was unbudgeted, implemented during the time frame described by Congress for the usage of CRF dollars and implemented in response to the pandemic, the executive branch has determined that CRF dollars could pay for this program um, instead of having to use general fund dollars. So council staff supports uh, both of these um, recommended amendments from um, from Councilman Reamer and from the county executive. And you, the council could either take them up individually or take them up as a group if they want to consider um, amending the resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Reamer. I'd like to move, it sounds like we could do them as a group. So I'd like to move both of the amendments that were described uh, by council staff. Thank you, is there a second? It's been Thank seconded you. by Councilmember Rice. The motion it was made by Councilmember Reamer, seconded by Councilmember Rice. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And I think we got a unanimous. We got a unanimous. Okay. Thank you very much. Next is item and number. Mr. President, you need to yeah. then vote on the entire resolution as amended. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilmember Reamer, will you move the entire resolution? Let's move the whole resolution. And Council Member Rice, will you second that as well? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that carries unanimously as well. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Howard, for reminding me of that. Uh, ne next item, the agenda item that we have is a agenda item number eight. This is a public hearing on special appropriations to county government's FY21 operating budget, Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, NDA, in the amount of eight million $230,497 for Restaurant Relief Grant Program. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. Ms. Kennedy, it is my understanding we do have a, at least one speaker for this hearing. That's correct. We do have just one speaker, and that would be Laura Calderon. Ms. Calderon is testifying via video. You may unmute and begin your testimony. Um, well, thank you, Mr. President Katz, and to all of the um, county uh, members. This is my first time speaking in front of all you, so I'm a little nervous. But um, my name is Laura Calderon, and I own a small catering business, actually. So I consider ourselves similar to restaurants as we function very Excuse slow. me, if I could interrupt. Yes. Um, we um, just received word from the control room that we're realize that um, we're in a time of the season uh, where we do see a rise in pedestrian collisions. So we, we try to combat that with education, enforcement, um, and we try to go proactive with things like this. Last year in Montgomery County, there were close to 500 pedestrian crashes. 14 of those were fatal. Statistics show that pedestrians walking around dusk are nearly three times more likely to be struck by cars in the days following the end of daylight saving time. Everybody has a role in traffic safety. Pedestrians, bicyclists, 
and vehicles. As far as pedestrians are concerned, um, some easy steps are wear things that might be more visible when it gets darker out. Um, even to the extremes of wearing a vest, it, that could help. And I get that those are tough things to sometimes do for going to work and things like that, but um, trying to remain as visible as possible is one thing. Two, use sidewalks uh, when they're available and, and walk there and not in the roadway. And when you do have to cross the roadway, try to get to a lighted intersection or a marked crosswalk. And third, avoid distracted walking. Councilmember Evan Glass says with the time change that is happening, everybody needs to be aware of their surroundings. If you are a pedestrian, you know, maybe take the earbuds out, look around and just be aware of when you're crossing the street. I always try to make eye contact with the driver so that I know that we see each other. And let's see what we got here. We have one car stopped and another's going to keep going. You need courage to be able to do this. And it is so important because uh, we can't presume that drivers are seeing everybody who's on, on the street. Um, it's unfortunate to say, but that's just a reality. The county and state have invested in improving intersections with the installation. I still don't. Yeah. We are back on the air, so we we can start one more time, Mr. President. The next item that we have is agenda item number eight. This is public hearing on a special appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget, Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, NDA, in the amount of $8,230,497 for restaurant relief grant program. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. Ms. Kennedy, it is my understanding we do have a speaker for this hearing. We do. Laura Calderon is here via video to provide her testimony. Ms. Calderon, you may begin. Um, thank you, Mr. President Katz, and to all the council members. Round three, let's do this. <laughs> um, so my name is Laura Calderon. I am a small business owner. Um, I own Relish Catering with my husband, who is a first-generation American, and I employ a number of immigrants. And... Um, we have already utilized many of the grants that have been available to us and available, um, and this has allowed us to continue operations and continue to serve our community in need. We've been providing meals for shelters here in Montgomery County, for the children's inn, for hospital workers, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, frankly, our industry is drastically impacted. Um, our, we're struggling, and as cold weather approaches, we are anticipating that um, Outdoor dining options are going to decrease as COVID increases. People are going to be more anxious about dining out, and therefore we are going to be seeing less revenue over the next few months. Um, typically, when we see a boon of economic, you know, prosperity with the, the inauguration coming up, which we're all very excited about, um, we know we're not going to have that this year, and restaurants aren't going to have that this year. And we need this financial support because not only my small locally owned business. My family lives here, uh, my team members live here, but we need, a lot of our team members have spouses who are also in the hospitality industry and have been drastically impacted economically by the pandemic. And with money from these grants, these are preventing people from going on food stamps, from going on Medicaid, from relying on social support systems that we can give them a job, we can keep them working, we can continue to help our community in need. I mean, I was just talking with Brett Myers today from Nourish Now, um, and we're utilizing some of the products that they're getting to help subset or offset the costs of what we are preparing for the shelters. And um, I'm just one speaker for the many restaurants, um, and I hope that I can be a voice for all of them, but we're really struggling and we need these people to keep having their jobs. This is the demographic and particularly our team members, like I said, who are mostly immigrants, we can't afford for the gaps to get bigger with them. Um, we need to help them. We need to help our team members. We need to help our diverse community. And this will be a win-win. By providing money and finances for restaurants and catering businesses like myself, who are small, all of our money goes back into the local economy. I get my car's maintenance here. I buy my products here. I brought, you know, our team members, you know, do everything here in Montgomery County. Um, Ms. Calderon, yes. 
so sorry. My apologies. Your time is up. We gave you a little extra time. Thank you so much, but we got to, we got to stop. Okay. Well, thank you for, for everything. I appreciate every, you. all the work you're doing. So thank you. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Thank you. We're going to close this public hearing. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, Gene Smith, did you want to have a comment? Uh, sure. I just wanted to note that both um, Ms. Benjamin from the County Executive's Office and Mr. Wu from the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation um, and MCDC will be running and administering this or here if the council has questions. But given the speed with which this appropriation moved through, I thought it also might be helpful if um, Mr. Wu could share a little bit about administering this program so that restaurant owners in the county understand how the program will operate. Okay, Mr. Wu, please. Thank you, uh, Council President. Uh, I, well, first, I wanted to actually defer uh, to Tina Benjamin uh, for uh, her opening, and then I can add on. Ms. Benjamin, please. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. So this is a, a great opportunity for us. A couple weeks ago, the governor announced a $250 million package, aid package to businesses and arts institutions and tourist establishments. As part of that $250 million, he um, allocated 50 million to restaurants that are really suffering throughout the state of Maryland. And in accordance with that, he also said, and I want the local jurisdictions to run the programs and disperse the funds. So that is a new source of money for us, which is just phenomenal because as our um, speaker just discussed, restaurants, caterers, wineries, all the um, food service establishments in the county are really having a hard time. So this program um, will be administered by our Economic Development Corporation. We will be jointly promoting this program along with the 3R program and Reopen Montgomery, trying to provide as much financial support to restaurants and related establishments here in the county. So thank you. Thank you. If I could add on to uh, Tina's uh, statement, and as uh, Ms. Calderon had said, mentioned, uh, our restaurants have been particularly hard hit during this pandemic. And so uh, with the uh, county executive's leadership and also the council's support, uh, Montgomery County has been helping with creative pivots, outdoor streeteries and regulatory changes like relaxed rules on alcohol takeout and delivery. Uh, and so this restaurant relief fund grant is just another way to help support continued operations through the winter months and the holiday season. Uh, this is uh, a complementary program to existing programs that we already have that can help restaurants, including the 3R initiative, as well as the Reopen Montgomery grants. Uh, and uh, you know, this is a, a terrific way uh, for us uh, to continue uh, to support uh, this industry that has been so devastated uh, by the pandemic crisis. And if I could uh, also add that, you know, our food service industry has also relied on new and loyal customers to keep them growing uh, through these hard times. And so we're also hoping uh, that these customers can also help spread the word about this new grant. Uh, so for those who are listening out there, please let your favorite restaurant know that they can qualify uh, for uh, this program and that we plan to have information up on our website, thinkmoco.com by the end of this week. You know, there's always been a tremendous support for local businesses. So please continue to patronize our restaurants through the holidays, whether it's online ordering, curbside buying, uh, or uh, purchasing gift cards. Uh, this is a terrific way to help continue to support our local small businesses and to make sure that we can also uh, make uh, the word known about this grant opportunity. Uh, the MCDC intends to uh, um, partner uh, with uh, our uh, local media, uh, as well as the ethnic media, uh, to ensure uh, that and more restaurants know about uh, this program uh, and this available aid uh, to assist them. Uh, and uh, as Tina mentioned, uh, we'll be working uh, complementary uh, with the 3R initiative and also reopen Montgomery uh, to publicize uh, this restaurant relief fund uh, to uh, all restaurant establishments uh, so that uh, they're aware of how these three programs uh, can assist them through these difficult times. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Smith? Um, I believe Mr. Friedson sent an email earlier this morning um, noting some amendments. I can turn it to him if you'd like. Well, to I'm going to call on him next. Okay, very good. And then the, 
the last item I have is I just want to note that the council received an email this morning from the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce, and I'll just note that the resolution um, to their concern, the resolution does allow for businesses who have already qualified to, to qualify for up to $10,000 under this new program, as long as the expenditures are not the same expenditures that they've qualified previously for other county grants. Um, so it is a new money um, and for new expenditures, but um, if they have the same receipts, basically, they would not be able to use those for this program. Thank you. Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I just wanted to thank Ms. Benjamin and the executive branch, Mr. Wu and Mr. Tompkins and everybody at MCEDC and Mr. Smith. A lot of uh, work to, to get into this on a very short time frame to be able to move forward with the governor's uh, timeline that was uh, put forward. And I think we're set up really well here. I also wanted to acknowledge and appreciate the fact that uh, the executive branch and MCEDC in this proposal has taken the broadest possible allowance for what is considered to be a restaurant. Very important to note that that does include wineries and breweries and food trucks, uh, along with, uh, you know, a traditional restaurant, uh, how uh, many would, would think of it that is allowed under the, uh, the uh, state's uh, grant program uh, that we received. And I think it's an important a point that should be made since that is not has not necessarily been how we have defined it previously, but I think it's a, a significant uh, positive uh, step in this proposal. I also want to point out the 8.2 million that we're receiving. It's the highest that any jurisdiction is receiving. It's based on the fact that we have the highest number of uh, restaurant based establishments in Montgomery County. It's not often when we get our fair share in Montgomery County based on the needs that we have uh, in the county. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that and appreciate the fact that uh, in this particular case uh, that actually uh, did occur. And also uh, we heard from Ms. Calderon, uh, how much our restaurants and food-based businesses are both struggling and helping. Uh, you know, they are dealing with the worst of both worlds where they are uh, key to dealing with uh, some of our most vulnerable residents, some of whom are their own employees, and also, uh, uh, you know, are struggling uh, themselves uh, working with you know, local organizations like Nourish Now and MANA and uh, various uh, uh, local food uh, uh, recovery uh, efforts. So I just uh, think that this is an important lifeline uh, for those businesses. Um, and then the last thing, just to, to make sure colleagues receive the email that I sent around working with the executive branch and MCEDC, uh, a, uh, an amendment here, which is allowed under the uh, state grant uh, to utilize 400,000 of this appropriation to fully fund the three R uh, restaurants uh, so that everybody who applied and is eligible and qualified uh, can receive that grant funding. So we don't have to turn anybody away through that program, which uh, has been successful. Uh, and then uh, the remainder of the 7.8 million for this uh, new uh, restaurant uh, grant uh, program uh, to be able to uh, support as many uh, businesses as we, we can. Uh, this is not dissimilar to uh, what we did with the arts grants, where we came back and did supplemental funding to make sure that everybody uh, could be funded to their full, uh, you know, uh, their full um, request, and then it could be equitable across everybody. And that's what the intention uh, is here. So that would be 400,000 uh, for that purpose. The 7.8 million dollar balance uh, would then go towards this new uh, restaurant relief grant program, and I would move that uh, forward for colleagues' consideration. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by Councilmember Reamer, and Councilmember Reamer, you're the next speaker. Thank you. I'm really pleased to see the success of this program. Uh, Council President Katz will remember this emerged out of our business recovery group that we convened in the early stages of the pandemic, and uh, we were particularly excited to see the amenities or the, you know, the approach that Bob had taken in Bethesda to create a streetery. And, and we, we knew that that was going to work and it was going to, it was a viable way for the county to support businesses. And so we conceived of the, the idea of a 3R program with MCEDC to bring that uh, support to communities around the county that, that didn't have it. Um, and MCEDC is administered it really effectively. And I really want to thank Council Member Friedson for being focused on this issue throughout and, and making sure we didn't miss an opportunity here to keep this program growing and building and, 
and uh, you know tapping into new ways to expand it. So um, it's a, I'm really happy about it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, all of the effort that's going into this, and I hope that our businesses indeed will be able to take advantage of it, um, and uh, we'll get the word out. So, thank you, Councilmember. So, we're voting on the amendment. The Councilman I made by Councilmember Freitzen and seconded by Councilmember Reamer. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous. I have gotten a a text from Councilmember Juando who's having technical difficulties, that he's in favor of the amendment. And it, as he is, I don't want to uh, let everybody know his vote, but he's also in favor of the motion in general. Councilmember Friesen. Yeah, I'll just, I was just going to move the full resolution. That was going to be my ask. Councilmember Reamer, were you going to second it? It's been moved by Councilmember Friesen, seconded by Councilmember Reamer. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that carries unanimously as well. And I'm speaking for... Councilmember Jawando, who has texted me. So it is unanimous. Thank you all very, very much. The next item that we have is item number nine. And this is a briefing from the Inspector General Report. County SharePoint platform exposes sensitive information of vulnerable populations. OIG publication number 21-003. And I'm going to ask Ms. Michelson to please uh, explain that to us. Yes, thank you. Um, you have before you the um, IG, OIG report, and you will be getting a briefing from the Inspector General, um, followed by an opportunity for executive branch staff to um, respond. And uh, we also have uh, Dr. Costas Torregas with us today. In case you have any um, technical questions, which I am not the right person to answer, um, I will note that um, this report highlights the, the difficulty of us both trying to use uh, platform sharing technologies, which are really critical to the work we do, but at the same time protect sensitive personal information from being exposed. Um, I do think that there's a lot of broad level policy issues here and then perhaps some real, some technical details. So at some point in this conversation, you may decide that some of the technical details would be better addressed in the committee forum. Um, but I do think this is a, a great place to start. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Inspector General Lamarzi to start no, with the President. Oh, interrupt. We're going to turn uh, first to uh, Councilmember Navarro as Chair of Government Operations. Yes, and then we'll go to Ms. Lamarzi. Right. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you. Please. Thank you. I want to thank uh, our uh, Inspector General, Ms. Megan Lamarcy, for her work on this issue. Uh, going through the report, I was pleased with the detailed investigation and the amount of thought that went into the recommendations. As serious as these issues are, I will refrain from relitigating the issues so well laid out in the report. But of the five recommendations by the Inspector General, the county executive staff disagree with two of them and offers alternative solutions, which the Inspector General is not satisfied with. We must find a consensus of position that works for both sides and protects our systems and residents. As the Inspector General notes, though, this is not the first time there have been reports of breaches to our systems. The county government has been slow or unable to make appropriate corrections acceptable to successive Inspector Generals. In the absence of consequences, Inspector Generals have resorted to repeating their findings, and I believe that this must change. I want to also point out that the Government Operations Committee in the past has worked diligently to increase resources when it comes to issues of cybersecurity and ways to protect and mitigate risks. And we will continue to do whatever we can to support uh, strengthening all of these particular kinds of matters. Reading through the report, there are many questions, of course. Uh, for example, uh, issues of timeline of action. Um, how will we ensure that the Inspector General's recommendations are responded to appropriately and promptly moving forward? What are the barriers to this? Um, in this instance, we're talking about exposure of records and private medical details of minors. Why is this data not walled off and made accessible on a strict need to know basis? Um, do we need a, a thorough and comprehensive external forensic audit of our online work? Uh, should the county investigate other options beyond the file sharing platforms that we currently use? Do we have the capacity in-house? 
and in the Inspector General's office to do digital forensic work? And if not, what is the vision for ramping up this capability? Of course, we discussed this as well previously in, in, in our last week um, report as well. Um, we need to have a conversation about our technological systems. Uh, they are in need of upgrades and reading this report and that on the use of differential pay, it seems that there are challenges with integrating the disparate systems in our county. Um, we need, I think, to discuss our current process for training county staff on this very important issue. In other words, what is it that we can do to help? Is it a capacity issue? Um, I think also it's important to know that on October 7th, 2020, a Washington Post article stated that several employees of Treehouse uh, who had blown the whistle on other issues suddenly found themselves without jobs, and they are convinced that they were retaliated against. Um, to the extent that we give uh, this organization approximately a million dollars in funds, this is a real concern to me, and we need to understand what is the status of that situation. In other words, these are all questions questions that I would like for us to address, uh, working with the Inspector General and appropriate staff as we review this report in greater depth. And of course, the Government Operations Committee stands ready to assist in any particular way to provide answers and also follow up to these issues so that we can, again, not only mitigate but protect the privacy of our most vulnerable, um, particularly our children. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lamarzi, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Council President Katz, Council Vice President Hucker, members of the County Council. Thank you for inviting me here this afternoon to speak about our most recent report, uh, 21003, which regards the exposure of sensitive information of vulnerable populations on the County SharePoint platform. This investigation was the result of a complaint that we received on our fraud hotline from a County employee who while searching for one of their own documents, came across a document that included a great deal of personal identifying information, PII, as well as protected health information, PHI, for clients at the Treehouse Child Advocacy Center. For those who don't know, Treehouse is a nonprofit contractor with the county. They contract with HHS and provide evaluations, therapy, support services, and care to child victims of physical and sexual abuse. My office immediately began an investigation. I will note we did receive this uh, report on September 23rd and were able to issue a report the very next day because we worked so quickly to address these issues. We quickly found not only the initial documents that were the subject of the complaint, but more than 260 other documents and files with PII and PHI. Our further investigation resulted in findings that there were a plethora of documents that are easily accessible to any county employee or contractor on the SharePoint site. Documents were found from other departments as well and included personal information such as social security numbers, banking information, tax ID information. And this was especially concerning because as uh, Council Member Navarro just said this was not the first incident that we had raised issues of data security within the county, particularly as it related to file sharing platforms, which of course have become very important in terms of the telework that's being done throughout the county. This investigation centered on SharePoint, but in both February and May of this year, we alerted the administration to vulnerabilities related to another file sharing platform called DELT. In May, we actually discovered PII, which included a social security number, Medicare information, other personal information that was on SharePoint, that was on Dell. And at that time, we recommended, similar to what we recommended in this report, restricting or deleting documents with personal information from shared document locations. And we recommended in particular that HHS prohibit employees from sharing documents with this sensitive data without using an encrypted email or other restrictions on a sharing platform. We were not aware of any uh, direct changes that had been taken in May, though I do know that in August, DTS began uh, a new project mapping permissions on SharePoint in particular, but we are concerned that still did not address the security related to individual documents. My predecessor issued a report regarding the need for improved controls over access to information in 2018 and 
Internal Audit also issued a report in 2017, which found that there were inadequate policies and procedures in this same arena. With this report, we made five recommendations, and as noted, the CAO concurred with three of those. But for two of those recommendations, in particular, we recommended that the county discontinue the use of file sharing platforms until data security vulnerabilities are addressed, and we recommended that county employees and DTS delete documents that contain PII and other sensitive information from document sharing platforms. The county administrative officer has said that that would be impractical, considering the need for this to continue daily operations within the county. But my office continues to be concerned that there are documents containing sensitive data that have not been secured still. And I do note that our recommendations recommended that they stop using these platforms until the vulnerabilities are addressed. As recently as Friday, we discovered documents on SharePoint with social security numbers and other sensitive information. Another county platform that we use called OneDrive had a document that appears to include the names of children and dates of birth that are serviced at HHS, perhaps with protective services. And so while there are challenges to making these changes, vulnerabilities do still exist. Our report was issued 45 days ago, and these documents continue to be available to anyone who does not have an actual need for those documents. I do want to acknowledge that the county acted quickly when we reached out to them and did shut down Treehouse's data as soon as possible. And our hope is that this project will continue and the vulnerabilities addressed sooner than later, because it puts not only these individuals whose data is out there and accessible at risk, but it is a huge vulnerability to the county itself. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have after you've heard from others. Thank you. Is there any other presentations? No? Yes, I believe. Did the county government want to... Is Ms. Roper, did you want to... I wasn't sure what is the format. Hi, this is Felicia. So we don't have a presentation, but we would be happy to go over what we have done to remedy some of the, I guess I would say, technology breaches, and there are many other related issues as well. But as far as the SharePoint, of course, I'm going to turn it to Ms. Roper to go over what we have done. But just for the point of clarification, I know IG's report refers to SharePoint, but there are two others, SharePoint, OneDrive, and our group teams. And each of them are going to have different solutions. So I'm going to turn it to Ms. Roper to explain that. In addition, we actually have the experts, our consultant here, to possibly even answer some questions about what is happening in other places. And since they have done the initial scanning of the system, and they are the ones that are going to implement the final solution for us or permanent solution for us, so we thought maybe that is helpful for them to answer your questions as well. With that, I'm going to just turn it to Ms. Roper. Thank you. Good afternoon. So what I'd like to say in terms of my observations of our use of collaboration tools, the tools were rolled out. I think the gap between having those kinds of tools available in an organization is to have a framework around them and also to have some functionalities in order to identify sensitive data on a routine basis. What we have done here recently is when we renegotiated the Microsoft contract, I was able to get some licensing that should be in place called advanced threat protection that will help in terms of 
uh, protecting data leakage in our organization, and then also um, looked at some best practices in terms of how other organizations, other municipalities are uh, protecting uh, their organizations. And we decided to, uh, to procure Veronis, which is a tool that will allow us not only to remediate the situation, it's more or less a, a, a moving target because of the amount of data um, that is out there and the amount of uh, individuals that use um, these um, these sharing uh, uh, platforms. Uh, I, I think that it's going to be imperative for us to understand that it is going to be a day-to-day -day, um, observation of data and tracking of data and labeling of data. Uh, I can say um, that we do have those tools available to us now. We're in the process of rolling those uh, those um, particular tools out to uh, to protect our, our data. Uh, we have actionable uh, steps uh, going forward to get these tools in place so that we have um, a operational way of uh, identifying data, uh, protecting our data. And I, I also can say I've had lots of conversations with other jurisdictions uh, close by us. Um, that are using uh, these types of tools, have been using them for some time. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the Veronis tool is being used in other jurisdictions close to Montgomery County. And we want to, um, we want to accept the issue, understand that these collabor collaboration tools are not going away. Uh, they're utilized in private and public sector, uh, that the missing aspect of it for us is the framework policy and training around these tools. Um, that has been uh, my observation. As you all know that I've been on staff now for seven, eight months. And I, I think that we can move swiftly in getting these tools in place and, and uh, resolving these situations going forward. From a remediation standpoint, um, we have instructed uh, departments um, to begin to look at their sites, their collaborative sites, and go back and um, and close, shut them down when necessary, and to really take a look with a fine tooth comb around those sites, those sites that do not need to be openly shared. Uh, we did have uh, an exercise a few months back um, where we actually took away the option to leave things open so that if a user goes in and is sharing a file, initially the way the system comes out of the box is that it's open to anybody publicly. And we took away that option so that a person has to really think about storing that file and who they would actually like, have, like to have access to that file. We're gonna have to do more of that. Some of it is uh, user training uh, some of it is being more mindful of um, what kinds of data needs to be encrypted, what doesn't, and, and then moving forward um, from the DTS perspective with monitoring and making sure that it's an operational part of what we do every day as, we, as it relates to the protection of data and data leakage. I have, um, I have uh, Keith Young, um, who is on, and uh, Keith can talk more about the history um, of this issue and uh, a little bit more about the remediation uh, in the departments. One other thing I'd like to say is that I think that we are gonna have to be stronger in terms of the remediation and it, it needs to move a lot faster than it, than it has. Keith, would you like to add anything to that? Yes, thank you, Gail. I, I do wanna mention a couple of things uh, going back to Ms. Marcy's uh, report in terms of uh, is it possible to turn off these file sharing platforms? And technically I would say that it is, that the challenge comes with how it would impact the business. So for instance, uh, today we have over 16 million files shared across the organization in OneDrive, uh, about 5.7 million files in SharePoint teams and groups, uh, and about 257 million uh, files or emails contained in our email system. So. We're not talking about small amounts of data. We're talking about massive stores of data uh, across the entire county that would be impacted by if we decided to shut off these particular services. And another thing I do want to note, uh, as uh, Ms. Uh, Kassiri and, and Ms. Roper brought up before, is that these are three distinctly separate services that are provided under Office 365. 
without getting too geeky or too technical, they share the same background, but how you manage them and how you govern them are three completely different ways. So what we've done as far as SharePoint is we've been working with each of the departments uh, since around uh, early May to remediate. We've got 24 departments have completely redone their SharePoint re-architecture. Three more departments uh, found that they weren't even using their SharePoint sites and deleted them. And the vast majority of the remainder are, are almost near completion. As we look at the second service with groups and teams, uh, back on November 4th, we took all of the, uh, so we have about 6,000 groups and teams in the county today, about 1,200 of them were public, which means that they were shared with everyone in the organization. And so back on November 4th, we turned all of those public groups to private and also instituted a process where if anyone wants to make a, a private group public, they have to go through my team to review these specific types of data and what they plan on doing with that site. And then finally, as mentioned a couple times before, is that uh, we have the, the large amount of files in OneDrive, uh, and we found approximately 60,000 files were shared with everyone in the organization with a couple hundred of them containing sensitive data. And so this week, uh, we are going to be implementing the lockdown of those files so that those aren't shared with everyone in the organization. And from a historical perspective, uh, this goes back to the defaults that the county had prior to March of this year. So the defaults, when people would open up a file and save a file, it would be shared with everyone in the organization. So this is going back and cleaning up these legacy files that have been around for years to make sure that, again, they're not exposed to everyone that has a log on within Montgomery County government. Uh, a couple other things to note is that, as Ms. Roper mentioned before, is we're in the process also of deploying Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection. Some of the things that it adds is uh, email encryption for all users, two-factor authentication for all users, uh, being able to upgrade people's office for nearly every user in the county, and much better user visibility so we know what people are doing and know what they're saving. Uh, Additionally, uh, since we were talking about encryption and, and one of the things that was mentioned in the previous reports, it's two things to note is that within Office 365 is all files are encrypted at both in REST and in transport. So uh, that means that when they're on OneDrive, when they're on Teams, when they're on SharePoint, they're already encrypted. If they're sent outside the county via email, then that is when users will need to use their email encryption. And again, that feature is now available with the purchase of the Office uh, ATP uh, license agreement in August of this year. And as we talk about, uh, I, I don't want to steal his thunder, but uh, Dr. Toriagas, uh, one of his recommendations was to have users complete the security awareness training if they're in nonprofits or outside the county. So today we already do require that uh, for any uh, users that are accessing county systems, including treehouse staff. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Stephen from Veronis to talk about what he's seen in other uh, state, local, and Fortune 500 organizations across the U.S., if that uh, makes sense to everyone. Okay. Thank you, Council Members, for having me. Uh, I, as mentioned before, I work for an organization called Veronis. Uh, my title is Director of Enablement. I've been in cybersecurity for about 10 years. I've been in IT for well over 20 uh, I actually reside in uh, lovely Minnesota, where if I might offer a small moment of levity when it comes to uh, this very serious situation, ob uh, obviously, my wife is actually a county commissioner for Ramsey County in Minnesota. So I actually am more than just a little bit familiar with some of the workings of, of county governments. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Veronis is uh, and what we've done and what we're seeing in the industry and how we'd be able to help. Uh, first and foremost, Veronis was founded in 2005. Uh, we are a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ. Uh, we have, uh, and we, what we've designed is a data security platform that is focused on what we would hear, would hear referred to as unstructured data, uh, sometimes called dark data, and that would be files, spreadsheets, emails, uh, typically the type of lifeblood that gets an organization like yours moving. Um, the downside that we have seen with this is because of the sensitivity of the information, 
that can be contained within these repositories, be it an on-premise file share uh, or an Office 365 repository like OneDrive or Teams uh, or SharePoint Online, uh, but exposures tend to creep up. Uh, and what we've seen even more so uh, over the last year, uh, to give you a perspective on this, um, I remember when Microsoft in Q3 of 2019 was extremely excited because they had achieved 17 million users on Teams. And this was the first time that they had more users on that platform than Slack's uh, 12 million at the time. Their last report stated that this is that they are now up to 113 million users because of the change of what has happened in our world. Obviously, it's a completely different situation. I, myself, am also working out of my home office like many uh, uh, millions of other people because of the situation that's going on with COVID. Um, the unfortunate aspect of the platform that Microsoft designed when it comes to Teams and OneDrive and, and those uh, 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 and SharePoint Online is they built it for collaboration to make it easy for us to work in different situations, in different locations, and, and to be able to work effectively to coordinate on documents, coordinate on, on information, uh, and be able to move the business forward. The downside of that is exactly what has been discussed and what I've heard so far today. Um, there's frequently situations where users are not maliciously, just unknowingly putting information in places that are exposed either internally to others within the organization, or in sometimes the worst case scenarios where it can be exposed to uh, external organizations. What Veronis has designed is a platform that helps uh, close some of the gaps, um, you know, build, basically build on top of the security solutions uh, that Microsoft already provides within their system. So what Veronis will go through and, and does is it does a content classification, identification, looks inside of every single file spreadsheet and, and looks for information such as PII or uh, you know, personal information, health information, social security numbers, driver's license, credit card numbers. All of this is out of the box. It will scan all the documents that are out on these repositories and report where that sensitive data is. The next thing it does is it goes through and maps all the access that your users and groups have within your system. It understands uh, where uh, that exposure to a document might be over permissible. The next step, and this is probably one of the most important aspects of this, is we track every single interaction. So anytime a user logs into Office 365, um, you know, checks their email, uh, interacts with information, creates a sharing link, um, you know, coordinates with uh, other coworkers, we have a full audit trail activity of that. And that allows us to get a couple of really key things. The first thing it allows us to do is do analysis on all the existing access that you have today. We can tell if you have 20 users with access to a document, but only three of those users are using those ac that access, Veronis can then make recommendations to make changes to that access and reduce it to, as I heard uh, referred to earlier, a least permissive model, where only the people who need access to that have access. It also shares information such as where you have private teams, public teams, where each of those team sites is containing sensitive data. So you can put additional restrictions and lockdowns on those as needed. The second piece of that, other than restricting access to only the people, the right people that should have, have it, is we do a full baseline of what normal behavior is. Uh, as an example, to, uh, you know, to see if I can put this in a way that's easy to understand, um, our system will track, it knows that I log in from the same laptop that I have sitting on my workstation or sitting on my desk. It knows that I log in from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and that I connect into our corporate network, that I access information on Office 365, that I in interact with Exchange, and I touch the same documents that I tend to touch and I talk to the same websites that I normally talk to. So if we see any deviation from that behavior, that will start to throw up red flags in our system, in the Verona system. As an example, if we see somebody logging in from a different geographical location to Office 365 than they do normally, that's a red flag. If they start accessing data that they might have access to, but they don't normally touch, that throws up a red flag. Also, of course, if that data is sensitive, that raises the severity of that alert. What this allows us to do is oftentimes not only the first part, which is securing and making sure you have a low risk footprint, but the second part, making sure if someone is doing something nefarious with the data, either because they're an internal actor or because an external party has gained control of credentials and is starting to do something, uh, you know, starting to try to get access to something to, to, um, um, you know, to cause damage, 
that you'll be able to know when it's happening. You'll be able to respond to it very quickly. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any questions that I could answer for, for anyone else on here or if you'd like some more context about what's going on with some of the other organizations, uh, but that's the summary I came here on a plan to do. Thank you very much. We're going to turn to Dr. Turegas, please. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me, President Katz? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, and I wanted to start by thanking uh, Ms. Lamarzi for an excellent report. Um, it's, um, it, it has highlighted something that's of no surprise to the Government Operations Committee. Uh, the GEO Committee has been looking at this for over five years now and has been uh, focused on data, data security, data confidentiality, and structures. In fact, the GEO Committee started the discussions about having a chief data officer uh, and escalating that chief data officer to the highest level, a direct report to the CIO. Um, what you've heard uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, the private industry is that what we're facing is not new. It, it happens to every single uh, governmental entity and has to do with managing um, uh, specific uh, network concerns and identity concerns. I think what you also heard is that our CIO, who's only been on the job for nine months, is taking strong steps. This, you, you heard uh, the description about Office 365. What Office 365 is, is a huge change from what we had before, old outdated systems, to something that works in the cloud, something that works with online databases. And the training for Office 365 is something that we really have to take seriously countywide. Uh, the, the last thing I wanted to, 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 to pinpoint is the fact that as the executive branch is beginning to move, and it'll take some time, uh, there should be ways to secure the data, especially for those vulnerable populations. Uh, Mr. Young said that um, uh, um, uh, the, the data is encrypted. If, if they were encrypted, it would be hard for Ms. Lamarzi to, staff to find that data last Friday because that means that Ms. Lamarzi should have had the codes to open up the encryption that goes on for the data. What that means is identity management is equally important to the network security that uh, Mr. Young uh, so carefully does for our county. So it's a complex area. I, I have the greatest respect and the greatest support for Ms. Roper. I think she's on the right track. She's bringing in resources. She's renegotiated the contracts with Microsoft and she's bringing Baroni's. My hope is that we're on the track uh, to, to uh, reducing and eventually uh, 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 eliminating uh, those risks, but it's going to take some time. So I, I ask the council to be patient, but not uh, 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 take your foot off the gas, as it were, from insisting that data be secured. I think we're on the right track. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, and I, I hear you. We need to be we need to be um, efficient in what we're doing. We need to be patient, but not too patient. And that's exactly where we are. And I see everyone shaking their head. Yes, Ms. Casari, is there any other um, uh, presentations? No, just wanted to reemphasize and actually repeat again. We understand the severity of this. This is a very incredibly incredibly important issue. So our promises, we are on top of it. And, and we are so thankful, first of all, for having um, Gail Roper on our team now. So only thing, just want to make sure that, that I relay that we, we, we do understand how important this is. We are taking it seriously. And we, we promise you, and actually, this is not going to be, I know uh, Dr. Fregas mentioned, this is, com this is complex. But we believe it is software that we, we, we now procured and with how uh, Dr. Um, Ms. Ropers is focused on even data management. I believe actually we're going to be there very shortly. So we are confident we're going to be on top of this. We're going to have a handle on this very quickly. Thank you. Ms. Lamarzi, was there anything else from you? No. Ms. Navarro, before I call on other council members, was there anything else you wanted to add? There isn't, uh, but uh, as Dr. Torregas has uh, described, uh, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee will continue to work on this issue. We will follow up. It is something that we've been working on now for years. Uh, and so I do look forward to working um, with him as well as the administration and my colleagues uh, to definitely stay on top of this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Albernaz. Oh, thanks, Mr. President. And first, um, Chairwoman Navarro asked, 
all of the questions I had in advance. So um, I appreciate that. And most of them have been answered throughout this presentation. And I'm not going to pretend in any way, shape or form to understand the IT aspect of this. It is not my strength. Um, and so most of my questions as follow ups are going to be based on operational questions. Uh, some of this is coming as a former department head and providing a little bit of context and background in the transition that I saw over the last 10 years in terms of IT output within county government. Acknowledging I haven't been there for almost two years now, uh, so there may have been updates since then, um, but I think some of that context is relevant to this discussion. But um, I'd want to pick up where Ms. Kassiri left off, uh, which is acknowledging the severity of this. Um, these children are the most vulnerable of the vulnerable of the vulnerable. They have been traumatized. They have been abused. Uh, and so I want to thank once again, Ms. Lamarzi and her team uh, for handling this diligently and sensitively and aggressively. And whomever the county employee that once again has come forward uh, to acknowledge a wrong that needs to be righted within county government, they are to be commended as well. And as, as, Council, as Chairwoman Navarro indicated, there is of course a parallel investigation, which we're not gonna get into here uh, because it's in progress with regards to the treehouse specifically, because there are a number of layers there. And as chair of the HHS committee, we've been waiting on the results of that investigation before taking any formal action. Um, and so as soon as that's available, we will follow up on that. But I know there are a number of county residents uh, who are watching that case closely. Uh, and I want to assure them that this continues to be an extraordinarily high priority, uh, but we want to ensure that we have all the information before we take a next step there. So my operational questions are this, over the course of 10 years, a number of county government services, and this included DGS and human resources and information technology, services that had once been centralized within county government were pushed into departments in part as a matter of savings to address what had occurred during the recession when we had to let a number of positions go. And so again, two years ago may have changed. Um, but while I was there, what I found was um, each department had a significantly different level of sophistication when it came to their IT infrastructure based on the priorities placed within that department, based obviously on operational issues, but also based on the realities of their respective budgets. And so what sometimes happened was there wasn't a high degree of consistency in how policies were applied and how policies were administered. And it was really sort of catch as catch can. And so I wonder, or I'm concerned that now that we're in the midst of a pandemic where understandably our IT infrastructure in the county has had to work harder than any of us could have possibly imagined to set up the virtual work for all of our county employees and administer new policies on the fly, some of which again, we probably would have been very difficult to anticipate. But I'm, I'm worried that unless we have addressed those systemic and operational issues of providing the individual departments with the IT infrastructure that they need, and, and, and are we continuing to um, push some of this out to the departments or has some of this been pulled back? So from a practical standpoint, what you're describing all makes perfect sense to me, but there are different layers of sensitivity and personal information. And this should have been in that first tier, has to, be in that first tier. And so if HHS, which I know has incredible IT folks that have been working diligently, who is responsible um, for this transition in SharePoint? Is it centralized within DTS or is it the departments themselves? I'm sure it's a combination of the two, but if you could please describe that for me, that would be really helpful. Can I take a stab at that? So, so my observations are that um, there are many aspects of operational IT that are decentralized and some that of course are centralized. Um, I think that um, part of the challenge is 
um, draw, drawing that line between what needs to be centralized. I look at uh, the, the whole idea of protection of data, I think needs to be, just my opinion, needs to be uh, centralized. Uh, and then the, the output of that and the, and the training and the framework and the policy associated um, with that needs to be uh, shared from an enterprise perspective. I don't think that you can have rules, different rules in, uh, within the organizations. I also believe that the whole idea of uh, data leakage, data protection, advanced threat protection uh, belongs to the centralized IT organization because the tools are there, the competency is there, and the tools are there. And then um, with the tools that we have, with the Verona's tools, we're looking uh, enterprise-wide. We're not looking by department. We're looking for PII in all departments. We're looking for social security numbers in all departments. So I think those, uh, I think those, uh, those challenges need to be centralized. I also think that we have a liaison in each of the departments, but it all depends on what that liaison is charged with. So that person could be spending 95% of their day doing something on a system. And, and and I don't know that they they necessarily would have the time and the uh, the background and to have the uh, specificity required to to look at data from the perspective that that the centralized IT organization will. The, the only other thing I'll add to that is just from an observation standpoint that um, this whole consideration of uh, technology and innovation has to happen for the entire enterprise. It, it, it can't be decisions made departmentally. We're working right now with, um, with Mitra, uh, with the permitting department on a new system that we're having conversations with HHS about utilizing that same system so that we're not buying two systems. So, you know, though, you know, there is a strategic um, value to having this conversation that is countywide uh, rather than departmentally, m my opinion. Thank you. And and I guess my other question, and again, this is sore, somewhat operational, and, and forgive me, again, it's not my area of expertise, but I get working with the contractor to identify the IT solutions makes perfect sense again. And, and I, I was impressed uh, by Mr. Um, Fretham, I hope I'm pronouncing your name, Stephen, correctly. Um, I, I get where you guys are going, and I believe in the sincerity of Ms. Kassiri acknowledging this is a priority and the administration is going to be tackling this, um, you know, with, with everything it's got. But but I do worry about capacity, uh, and, and I also worry about information getting lost in translation. And so um, how specifically, Ms. Kassiri, what does the team look like beyond just the IT infrastructure um, that is in place within each department to actually implement these particular recommendations? Who, who's responsible? Is it you? Uh, is it one of our assistant CAOs? Um, and then my, my, I guess my final question for now is, in addition to looking at internal systems, would it make sense to identify an outside contractor or maybe the same one that can test our system, that can be almost like a secret shopper um, that that tries to poke holes? And and I, Mr. Tregas, I don't know if that's even a good idea uh, or that's practical. Um, I'd love to get your opinion on that. But I think that obviously, and the GEO committee has done an outstanding job and that predates my term in the, the, the legend body, I can speak about that in the first person as a former department head, always had the support that we needed. But now in this new environment that we're not going to shift from anytime soon, this, this is the new normal for the foreseeable future. Is there anything else that we need in addition to some of the solutions we've provided? So those are two questions. Uh, first, Ms. Mc, uh, Ms. Kassiri, and then Dr. Tregas, if uh, I would love your perspective on that. <clears throat> Remember, Alvaro, is you're absolutely right. As far as the IT resources, it varies from department to department. Today, we have David Godfrey, who is the CIO for HHS. There is him, and I believe he may have few other staff in HHS, which is different than one example is Rick. You, you're very familiar with the Department of Recreation. Um, what I can tell you, this is actually 
I would say me, me can't on behalf of the CAO. What we learned from this incident, actually, I, I, I know I didn't thank IG, but I want to formally thank her. So, so when we actually were implementing or um, um, trying to clean up the SharePoint, I'm not talking about OneDrive or the Teams, just the SharePoint. Up to this point, we have 24 departments that have done the cleanup. So departments like HHS, we, uh, they DTS, but they did the lion's share of work because they had the resources. But in the, share, in the, in the case of rec departments, since they don't have um, IT support, it was basically uh, Ms. Roper's team that did the work for them to help them, to guide them. So as our office, Office of the County Executive does not have a dedicated IT staff. So they actually supported us. So your question regarding the, uh, the, the nitty gritty of the resources, all I can tell you at this point, I promise you, the ones that don't have it, what we are doing, DTS actually kind of creating a, share, um, a shared resource model and helping them. As far as getting them permanent resources, frankly, we are trying to assist to see where that should be. Should that be in a shared resource model somewhere? Most likely if it's IT would be in Ms. Roper's shop or should be in departments. Um, as far as your question at the end, who's gonna be responsible has to be second floor on behalf of the CAO. So that's all I can tell you at this point. What I'm promising you is we are gonna, if there are resources, they are gonna be augmented by other means. Um, and this shared resource model I'm referring to, we are actually applying that not only to IT, for all back office support related also. As you may, you know better than anyone, not every department has, let's say, dedicated support to do the, to do the finance, budget, uh, procurement. And considering that also, we are not considering, we're actually working on that. So, but as far as going back to IT, yes, if, the ones that don't have it, at this point, we are looking at the share model. And if not, at this point, you have to consider to provide them additional resources. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Jawanda. Thank you, Mr. President. And I appreciate the line of questioning from my colleagues and, and uh, Ms. Roper. I continue to be impressed with your expertise and, and approach uh, in a systematic way. And, and boy, uh, I'm sure when you signed up like the rest of it, you didn't think 2020 was going to 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 be what it was. And 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 certainly, uh, Councilmember Abernathy's point about the IT pressures and uh, just everything. Our staff has had to deal with it as well. So, uh, Mr. Casas, thank you for your work. I have a related question. It's not specific to. I agree with the recommendations, and we have to keep an eye on this. And I'm very appreciative of Ms. Lamarzi, our loss was OIG's gain in, in the work that she's done. But I, I experienced this from the contractor side, and I know Treehouse is an example of that, but where where I am concerned, and I've seen this, we had this in the case of a uh, one of our workforce contractors where they had, it was actually physical files in that case, but it could it could have been, it, uh, it, you know, personnel files that were on a computer or, and as far as how, what's your role in securing when we have so many, one of our great strengths in the county is all the many nonprofits and other services that are delivered through contractors and the checks and balances that we have in place to ensure that their security of personal information and county information uh, is up to snuff in that in the sharing of documents that we limit any exposure well as their own personal network capability. Could could some, I don't know if it's you, Ms. Roper, maybe to start, but I, I just want to raise that and have someone address that as well. Um, Ms. Roper, are you trying to get off of mute? There you go. Okay. So, so I would I would say that um, there, that is the area that I described as policy, um, so it is not centralized. Um, the, the negotiation of contracts, I would say that the more significant uh, contracts with our main vendors are centralized in IT, and of course we partner with uh, with, with uh, purchasing procurement. 
but I, I would also say that there are scenarios where uh, contracts that uh, departments enter into contracts with various vendors um, that do not go through or are not, we have no oversight of. And, you know, that there is, a, I think, another opportunity for us to get more involved and to develop more policy around the content of those contracts and working more with our, uh, our, our legal arm, our attorneys, to make certain that those contracts are strong and that they have, um, so that, that we lessen the risk and vulnerability of, um, of what we might be signing up for. So I do believe that you brought up an opportunity for us to, to look at closely. I appreciate that. I think, it, I don't know, uh, Ms. Fariba, Ms. Kasiri, did you want to say anything about that? I hope that you, we would proceed in that fashion. I just think that's a, a baseline thing. We're only going to do more online, not less, and we already have a ton of vendors. So I think that needs to be, uh, I'm glad it's, you're putting it in that policy bucket, but I think within that bucket, it needs to be, you know, 1A, I think it, or top or near the top of the list. I agree. I agree. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. That was my question. Thank you. Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you to the Inspector General for another uh, really robust report. Uh, I uh, appreciate the fact that you're doing this work. I'm a little concerned about the fact that you've become uh, far too common a fixture at our council meetings as much as I uh, do appreciate uh, seeing you and uh, hope that um, you will continue your work, but that there'll be less reason for you to I have to come before us to share uh, troubling uh, circumstances uh, in county government. Appreciate the, the leadership of Councilmember Navarro and the uh, GEO committee and, and her uh, leadership there and, and Council President as well for, for scheduling this. Uh, and I, I, I want to say, you know, Ms. Roper, I really do have a lot of faith in you. I, I'm, I continue to be uh, uh, excited and, 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 and hopeful about changes that I know we both uh, share, uh, and, and, and you have uh, discussed with me, I know you're working hard uh, to, to implement them. It's not easy to turn a cruise ship and county government and its technology is certainly uh, that or larger. And so I, I do empathize for that, but uh, these are concerning uh, revelations here. Uh, both the fact that we're talking about, as council member Albernaz mentioned, the most vulnerable members of our community, children, uh, who are victims, and there are just no more vulnerable uh, people in our community uh, than that, and we need to be extra cautious and extra careful and take uh, uh, greater uh, efforts in order to uh, protect them. There was a reference earlier about uh, not having limitations to the business, you know, and, and, and to, to the business operations, and you know, we're kind of government. There is no business that we have that's more important and that's more sacred than protecting vulnerable children. And so we have to make sure uh, that we're taking that extremely uh, seriously. But I'm also concerned, and, and you recognize it, about uh, the remediation not moving as fast as it should be. I think you said it needs to move a lot faster than it uh, than it has. Uh, and so I appreciate that, but you know, we've got to address this. And, I, and I, I do continue to have a little bit of concerns about the response. And so first question, is there no alternative here for uh, folks in HHS and other related departments to uh, share or communicate this information other than these document sharing platforms that clearly have vulnerabilities? Is there no other process we could be putting in place to prevent these type of circumstances from happening, even if it's less convenient? Oh, so I would say that there are always, there are always other alternatives. I would I would stress getting this one right. Um, I think that you detract from the ability to share appropriately, um, and it going into you, you're going to find challenges with whatever option you use. I think there is an opportunity to get this right, and I think we're on the cusp of that, of getting it right. Um, I would say that we could, of course, look into not other options. Um, but I think there's costs associated with that, and and, and not to um, not to um, limit the opportunity uh, for us um, to look at other options. But 
but I, I would just say we're on the cusp of getting this this right. I, I, I strongly believe that that uh, the best practice model has to be followed with these systems. It's just it's more than technology. Uh, it includes uh, having policy and framework and training. It's more than technology. So if you go down this path where you think it's just the technology piece, you're never going to get it right. So there's a human side to this, and there is a, an opportunity uh, for us to uh, and enhance our ability to to train our staff on how to use this technology. They, the same practices that we have at home as it relates to our own personal finances and what we put on our personal computers. I would say before we go venture out and look at other options that we get this, that we work and strive to get this one right. Well, I certainly yield to you on your technological expertise, which you've forgotten more in the time we've been here than I've known about technology, but cost should not be the main factor here when we're talking about keeping vulnerable residents safe. If it comes to that, then I would hope that you would come to the council and request the funding and we need to prioritize it because we're talking about keeping vulnerable children, uh, many of whom are victims, uh, safe and, and keeping their information secure. Um, and, you know, it sounds to me, I mean, you're, to your point, it's not just about technology, it's about management, it's about leadership. And so, uh, you know, I hope that we can uh, move forward in, 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 in that direction, but hopefully cost uh, will not be an issue. I just wanted to address a couple of things that were concerning to me. Uh, one, there's an apparent distinction when it comes to restricting access to files shared prior to uh, March 2020. Um, there's a seems to be a discrepancy between the inspector general's views of file shared after 2020 and whether or not they're now secure uh, or whether or not the inspector general and her office were able to obtain file shared uh, in May or September without the appropriate restrictions. Can you speak to that? Is this just an issue for old documents and old files prior to March 2020, or is this a continued issue? Keith, could you speak to this, please? Uh, sure. So again, breaking down the three separate uh, <clears throat> platforms that are used for sharing. Uh, so for the most part, uh, when we talk about files on OneDrive, that would be prior to the change in March. It's gonna be files that uh, when we change the defaults in March to not share widespread, uh, it's legacy files that will be uh, cleaned up with the Veronis tool. Uh, teams and groups, uh, those have all been made private as of November 4th. So that's no longer an issue anywhere in the county. And uh, SharePoint, as uh, Ms. Kasiri mentioned before, is we are almost complete with all of the SharePoint re-architecture across the county. So the only thing that's really remaining are those files that are uh, that were shared in OneDrive prior to March of 2020. And how does that reconcile with the Inspector General's comments earlier in the meeting about uh, going uh, on to SharePoint and having uh, access to files that were unauthorized? So for SharePoint, at, for SharePoint, uh, for the remaining couple of departments or for uh, anything that uh, she found prior to November 4th, again, those were accessible. So uh, if there was a search done for sensitive files on November 3rd, she may have found uh, files in teams or groups. Well, okay. Friday, I heard, and I'll turn to the Inspector General. When you say Friday, I assume Friday means the most recent Friday that we have lived through, which would be after November 3rd. Is that right, Ms. Lamarzi? Correct. It was November 13th, Friday the 13th. Uh, one of the documents was on OneDrive, and I'd have to double check the date it was created, if it, if it predates March of 2020, but it, I don't recall that it did. We'll, we'll double check. Um, and the SharePoint files that we found, which had the social security numbers and other uh, personal information that those were items that we found. And it's my understanding that that was just happened to be one of the departments that hadn't been shut down yet. Mr. Young, does that uh, comply with what you just told us? That's correct. Uh, so what uh, she found was documents on a share drive site that's uh, still one of the few remaining sites. And then uh, OneDrive, again, uh, in working with Veronis this week, those sensitive files are going to be locked down since uh, the purchase of 
Veronis was uh, completed and uh, everything was uh, done as of Tuesday of last week. Mr. Friedson, uh, I, I know it's Tuesday of last week was before Friday of last week. No, I'm sorry that that, that the acquisition, the complete acquisition of Veronis uh, was completed on Tuesday of last week. So, so we how are, long will it take for us to be in a situation where we're not going to get a report from the inspector general that says that she or her team went and checked to see if there were documents like the ones that have just been, you know, that she found on Friday that have been shared here today, that that will not be an issue, that the issue will be new documents, new training, new procedures that need to take place, where obviously this is a constant thing that you have to keep up with, but how long is it going to take for that to be secured? So we expect it to be done by the close of this week. And Mr. Friedson, I'll, I'll just say it appears one of the documents I found was actually dated June 11th. So after March 2020? Correct. Okay. So, I mean, this is what's concerning to me. It doesn't seem like there is a total understanding of what the problem is. And unless you fully understand what the problem is, it's almost impossible uh, to solve it. And so I'm just concerned that uh, we have repeated issues here and with other reports where there are disagreements with the inspector general's report and the response is other than thank you for identifying it we're taking it very seriously and here's how we're solving it there's discrepancies and that discrepancy doesn't put a lot of faith it, that we are addressing the problem in a timely manner and that is to me the most concerning part here it's not that mistakes are made it's not that there are issues within the county government. It's not that people are doing uh, the wrong thing at times. It's that when problems are identified, they're not being addressed in a reasonable time frame, particularly when we're talking about the protection of taxpayer money, and in this case, even more so, the protection of the sensitive information for extremely vulnerable populations, namely children. So that, that's just really concerning. I'll just, let, let me close this. Ms. Lamarzi, you said in your uh, report that you continue to be concerned that the response from the executive branch does not seem to fully grasp the severity of our findings or the impact of data exposure in incidents to victims, including the county. After the information that you've heard here, the responses that we've received from the county government, have those concerns been mitigated or eliminated? We're going to continue to follow up and test the vulnerabilities as we move forward. Um, actually begun thinking and having conversations in my own office about ways that we can expand our capabilities and capacity to do more IT work, um, certified uh, um, information systems auditors are hot commodities in the IG community. And we have to do our due diligence to decide the best uh, most efficient way that we can bring those capabilities into my office and continue to monitor these situations. Um, I was happy to hear, honestly, that the SharePoint site that I found information on is just happens to be one that's been, hasn't been cleaned up yet. But I do continue to be concerned that OneDrive has so much information out there because when you deal with PHI, that is a huge vulnerability to the potential victims because it's their very sensitive data and to the county under HIPAA, the county could have all sorts of vulnerabilities. And so uh, we really want there to be some action as soon as possible. And, and again, the fact that we've raised concerns about platforms with sharing platforms all year, um, hopefully this will be the impetus that things really are, are going to be addressed. I appreciate that. I share that. I do hope that it is the impetus. I think that there is significant room for uh, better re responses and more confidence that we can have that it's moving uh, as fast as it needs to, given the severity of the issues. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I see no other council members on this. So wh where are we going to be from here? You're going to get back with us, uh, Ms. Kasari, when or we're going to go through uh, the GO Committee, uh, Councilmember Navarro, and get updates. Is that where we, our next step will be? Whatever Ms. Navarro to do so, I think, yeah. I mean, I think that, I think the 
goal was to have this briefing and then follow up questions, et cetera. We would be happy to discuss those and address those in GEO. And I'm sure Dr. Torregas has been keeping track of all the outstanding questions that we will then uh, discuss mm -hmm. and also report to, um, to our colleagues. Thank you. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to move on on the agenda. But thank you for being here. Obviously, this is of great importance, and we know that it's of great importance to all on this call. Thank you. The next item that we have is actually the semi-annual report of the planning board, which is not supposed to start till 345. So if it meets with my uh, colleagues' uh, approval, we could move uh, now uh, to legislative session day 35, the introduction of bills of 4520 and 4620, which we deferred from this morning. Does Mr. Katz, uh, Mr. Katz, I, I believe that the the planning board um, may be here and ready. You can, you know, still choose your order, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that we alerted them uh, to the timing issue, and I think they are prepared to begin. So, or if they are here, then we can begin. I, I didn't realize they were going to be 40 minutes. Or they planned on this. They, they're a planning yeah. board. Okay, we, very good. We, well, we're, we, I'm happy to do that. We plan on your being off schedule, so we, we're ready. We're ready <laughs> well, for anything. That's a good plan. I, I can <laughs> tell you. Okay. Welcome all from the planning board. Nice to see you. Uh, I think we have a slideshow uh, which has been provided to council staff. Um, Chair Anderson, which is the one that's coming up first? Are you showing the planning first? I think the planning slideshow has a couple introductory slides. Yes. And I believe. And I believe we have um, Vice Chair Fanny Gonzalez here too. Will speak to one of those slides. Okay, um, give me just a second here, and I'll put it on my screen and share it here in just a second. Sure. Well, while, while you're doing that, I, I think we can get started, just so we don't take any uh, more of your time than necessary. I want to thank you all for making time in the schedule. I know it's been difficult during the pandemic, and the last semi-annual we really uh, were left with just the slideshow. Uh, so it's great to be presenting to you live, if not um, in person. Um, and it looks like we have the slides up. Could we see the second slide? Um, I just checked our sign-up sheet. And as you know, we have the Thrive Montgomery general plan update public hearing uh, coming up on Thursday. Uh, we so far have 89 people signed up to testify, and I think that that is a testament to the effectiveness of the outreach that we've done even during the pandemic. But I want to turn it over to Vice Chair Fanny Gonzalez, if she's there, uh, to, to tell you a little bit more about what we've done to ensure that our outreach is both broad and deep. Natalie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. If the host can please allow the video to be turned on. Uh, hey. Let's see. Um, the, okay, hold on one second. Now I see. Now I see. It's on now. Thank you. So it is on. She meant she meant her personal video, Pam, not the not the slideshow. Oh, I'm sorry, because there's also a video that they sent, so I got confused. My it's okay. Thank you so much for having us today. It is great great pleasure that I want to talk about Thrive Montgomery only for a few minutes. As you know, this is a project that we have been working on since 2018. And there have been over 100 meetings pre-pandemic and now during the pandemic too. Uh, we have been across the county, uh, Germantown, uh, Silver Spring, Bethesda, Leetonsville, you name it. We've been there talking to different folks from the business community, from the civic community. Uh, we have been talking to nonprofits. Uh, like Casa de Maryland, for example, Latin American Youth Center, the Middle Eastern American Advisory Group. And at the end of the day, uh, everyone, regardless of background and language, we have been able to talk to people in, you know, in their native language, uh, Korean, Spanish. Um, everybody wants the same thing. You know, in 30 years, they all want to have a place to live, a job, wait, to, wait for them to get there. And we hope that the draft that we're working on will reflect that vision. And we look forward to our public hearing that is going to happen in a couple of days, as Casey just mentioned. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to let Wen 
when she gets her time to talk more about this. Thank you. Can we see, can we see the next slide? Thank you, Natalie. Uh, the other thing we wanted to mention uh, is, of course, the managed land study uh, proceeds despite everything. Uh, we filed comments which raise uh, many objections to uh, the state's plans. We have tried to be very careful to be uh, in sync with where the council is and our other elected officials not to get out ahead of you. But we also are mindful of our fiduciary duty to protect uh, parkland in particular. Our comments emphasize the idea that the purpose and need scope from the outset defined the justification of this project so narrowly that only a road widening project could meet the purpose and need. And as we predicted when we raised those objections initially, the draft EIS excludes uh, out of hand the possibility of transit as part of the solution to the uh, mobility problems and economic development uh, and transportation objectives, particularly of the I-270 corridor uh, out of hand. And we plan to press this uh, argument very strongly as we move uh, forward. We have been asked to uh, participate in mediation with SHA and we will of course uh, do that, but we'll be doing that in consultation always uh, with our uh, elected officials positions in mind. And we uh, really appreciate your guidance and, and support and look forward to our continued collaboration to try to get this project into a uh, shape that can be uh, supported by the county uh, and not just uh, the uh, people who are in power right now uh, in at the state level. Um, next slide. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Gwen. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about what we've been doing in uh, the Montgomery County Planning Department <laughs> over the past six months. It has been a really busy six months, and the, uh, the issue that we can't avoid talking about is how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected everything we do. The images that you see here are actually from a staff photography um, contests that we hold periodically through our design excellence program. And these are all photographs taken by our parks and planning staff to really um, get their sense of how they view our time during the pandemic. And I think they're very um, evocative. They, they certainly show that we've been dealing with uh, loneliness that we've been dealing with um, how important our parks are to uh, allow people to get out and have some activity in a socially distant and safe way, uh, how we are still gathering uh, to deal with some of the enormous racial equity and social justice issues that have come up during this time. Um, but uh, I thought these, these photographs taken by our own staff were very evocative of, um, of uh, the last six months and, and uh, what, a, what a challenging time it's been. Next slide, please. Um, with this slide, I actually would like Mike Riley uh, from Parks to join in. We just want to uh, emphasize the, the positive over the last six months. We've talked about some of the challenges, but uh, on the positive side, we have uh, moved in to our wonderful new Wheaton headquarters building. We are uh, so excited about it. it uh, as I describe it frequently, we're walking the talk. We're uh, putting into uh, place many of the ideas that we have talked about, that we ask private applicants to, um, to implement the issues of urbanism, of co-location, of transit-oriented development, of environmental sustainability, and of design excellence. And we're so proud of this building. Um, we have a little PowerPoint to show about the sustainability aspects of the building. I should say a little video to show about the sustainability aspects. I wanted to see if Mike Riley wanted to to add anything before we go into the video. 
Thank you, Gwen. I think you covered it pretty well. I just want to add that I'm really excited and looking forward to the day where we can work with Luisa Montero and the Urban District and the Recreation Department to program that great town square that's across from the building. Of course, right now we really can't do large scale events, uh, but hopefully once we get into next summer or fall, we'll really make that a hopping and happen place to be in Wheaton. And so now we'd like to show um, a video. If you can pull up the video, um, Pam, I think it's actually embedded in the PowerPoint. I think if you go to slide six and then just click on slide six, it should play. I'm having trouble. I'll, I'll get there one second. <laughs> Great. Oh. I'm going to do some narration as we look at this. Uh, again, this is focused on design, the sustainability issues. Um, one of the most important ones is its proximity right in downtown Wheaton. Um, the daylit stair, the high performance rain screen, some of the exterior shading elements, these are all elements that are helping us to achieve lead platinum, uh, which is the highest level in the lead system that one can um, achieve. Uh, in addition to the things you're seeing on the outside, you're going to see we're also um, on the inside having things like electrical vehicle charging stations. Um, we're not allowed to have individual printers at our desk uh, or mini fridges. <laughs> um, we use native plants and planting beds uh, as part of the whole project. And again, the proximity to public transit. These are all elements of the lead system is a point system, and you have to follow a certain number of points. We have our geothermal um, heating and cooling system, high efficiency water fixtures, and uh, the light system is great. If you don't move around enough in your office, suddenly all your lights go off. <laughs> I've had that happen to me several times. Um, you can see the incredible green wall that we have, which again is uh, something we carried over from the MRO building, which had a lot of interior uh, planting areas in the atrium. Um, and we are excited to have that in our new building as well. So now we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Um, we are excited to be in such a sustainable building. It is, um, you know, again, it's part of that uh, uh, walking the, the talk. We aren't just talking about sustainability. We're really living sustainability. Um, so we'll go back. Uh, the slide seven uh, is about engagement during COVID-19. And you've already heard uh, Commissioner Fani Gonzalez talking about the things that we have done in relation to Thrive Montgomery, but I do want to emphasize that is only one of our projects. We've actually uh, conducted all of our planning board and Historic Preservation Commission meetings virtually. Um, we continue to do virtual outreach on a number of our 
uh, master plans. You may have heard about some of our listening sessions for the Silver Spring downtown and adjacent community plan. We have had um, virtual events. And uh, as you can see, we've had a large number of participants in all of our meetings and um, our events. We're also, again, doing continuing to do e-letter and that is getting uh, the word out on a lot of our projects. Uh, next. These are just some examples of some of our virtual events for different activities, not just for Thrive. Uh, we're involved in big projects like Corridor Forward, which is the I-270 uh, transit plan, advancing the Pike District, which is looking at how we can move forward on many of the goals of the White Flint plan, um, and uh, our community chats related to Thrive. And again, as I mentioned, we're doing a lot of outreach for Silver Spring uh, as well. Next slide, please. This was a wonderful uh, comment we got from one of our community members after one of our Silver Spring listening sessions. Again, we've been working hard to figure out ways to use our technology to really um, allow for conversations. And we have uh, been able to use um, the Teams breakout room feature, and that's been great to allow for more uh, intimate conversations and not have it just be a series of lectures or um, uh chats through the chat function. We actually want people to be able to talk back and forth. And we did not solicit this comment, but we thought we would share it because I think, um, I think it shows we're having some success. Uh, next image, please. We also have continued to have an enormous number of development applications. Again, knock on wood, we have not seen a huge uh, slowdown in our development applications that have been submitted. Uh, as you can see, we've had over 300 applications of different types um, in the last, you know, again, approximately six months. And uh, the good news is that uh, that seems to be continuing even in the, in the last month or so. We have continued to get a lot of work in and our staff working virtually, continue to be fully engaged. Our development review committee meetings are conducted virtually. Uh, our design meetings with applicants are conducted virtually. Uh, and we are, um, we, you know, we feel like it's been um, very effective. Uh, next, please. A huge part of our work, um, not just over the past six months, but really for the last about two years, we've been thinking about an equity agenda for planning. And uh, we are, um, as you know, uh, looking at equity as one of the major parts of our Thrive Montgomery framework. Uh, we are uh, working on um, a lot of staff training. Uh, we have participated in training offered by the council, but we've also been offering uh, individualized training for a lot of our staff. We are um, working hard on the council's request to look at street and park facility renaming, and we'll be briefing the council on that in January. We actually had hoped brief you today, but the schedule uh, was such that it needed to be delayed till January. But please know our staff has been very, very actively involved in that. Uh, we have been, again, working on our outreach to try to reach people who have not traditionally been involved in the planning process. And really, most importantly, we are creating our, our own, within our organization, equity and master planning agenda and framework. We are working to uh, set up within the planning department an equity peer review group who will look at master plans and master plan recommendations as they are developed to make sure there is an equity lens 
to um, all master plan recommendations. We are also trying to identify within our three geographic area teams, uh, sort of equity leads uh, who will not only be liaisons, but will help um, make sure the work of those planning teams remain focused on equity. Uh, so we're excited to, uh, again, share with you in the near future some of our work on the street and park facility renaming project, but we also want to tell you that within our organization, we're working on what we think are some um, innovative ways of uh, really fully making equity a part of our day-to-day -day work, not just training our staff, which is important to raise their consciousness and to make sure that they have this as a focus, but to make sure that we're actually, you know, walking the talk again, my favorite expression today, walking the talk, that we are putting equity issues in high focus in our actual planning product. Uh, next, please. Um, Thrive Montgomery, again, you all are very aware of this project and that we are working hard to um, keep to the schedule that we had agreed to with the council. Uh, we're having a public hearing November 19th this week. As you heard, we have uh, well over 80 people already signed up to testify. Uh, we're very excited that people are engaged and interested and want to offer their input on this. We'll be having planning board work sessions then for several months, and then we will uh, transmit to you the planning board's draft of Thrive Montgomery 2050 in April of 2021. Uh, hopefully you then can take it up after your budget discussions and, um, and have your own public hearing and work sessions. So uh, we are uh, working hard to try to make sure that we are um, get, going to not only keep on schedule, but give you all an incredible product, an incredible plan that will have an exciting vision for the next 30 years in Montgomery County. Next. I don't even know if I should mention this, but you all, because you've all been so immersed in it, the growth and in infrastructure policy. I thought you were uh, saying you were gonna have to do it all over again. <laughs> no, let's start again, it was so much fun. Let's just do it again. Uh, I, I know you all are very familiar with the um, recommendations and what this policy is doing, but again, I, I think it's exciting. It is definitely in line with the ideas in Thrive Montgomery. Uh, we have been, as I've, I've said a number of times to different uh, constituent groups who we've met with on Thrive Montgomery, we're working on this long range general plan, but we're also sort of running and chewing gum at the same time, we're putting <clears throat> certain uh, ideas into action. And we've been doing that with the growth and infrastructure policy. Um, so we're very excited at how everything is coming together. Next. Um, <clears throat> a few regulatory projects that we want to highlight for you. Again, this is, um, exciting because they, they, there are some enormous projects that are moving forward in a very exciting way. In downtown Bethesda, <coughs> we continue to have excellent um, new projects. Really, um, I'm, so, I'm so pleased and proud of the, the design excellence that we're seeing in new uh, projects in downtown Bethesda. Our Bethesda Design Advisory Panel is working well. Um, <clears throat> St. Elmo Apartments is a residential project uh, on St. Elmo Street. Metro Tower is on um, Wisconsin Avenue, right uh, <clears throat> next to the Wilson and the Elm and across from the Avocet, all of which are incredible new um, new buildings and are a mix of residential and uh, office and hotel in amongst those three buildings, which again, I think is exciting. 
Uh, the Wilgus project is in North Bethesda. It is uh, <clears throat> part of what was the White Flint II plan. Uh, and it is a um, redevelopment of an area that is uh, essentially uh, empty. Uh, no housing is being displaced, but yet we're going to be getting new townhouse, two over two, and multifamily housing and open space, uh, including a, a park in the middle that is just under an acre in size. And um, it's going to, uh, we think, really add to the whole White Flint community. It's a little north of Pike and Rose, but it's really adding um, another element to that uh, exciting part of the county. And I wanted to mention just for your, in, for your information, we have been reviewing some solar projects uh, in areas of the county where solar is uh, permitted. Uh, we've approved two, one at uh, Cedar Ridge uh, Community Church and another called the Fieldcrest Community Solar Project, uh, which is near Laytonsville. And uh, so we're excited that we're seeing some uh, solar projects coming forward through our normal regulatory process. Next. And this is another project, again, we're very excited about, which is the expansion of Westfield Montgomery Mall. Um, the before and after, uh, the after is what has been approved. It's really breaking the box of those uh, interior malls, taking the old Sears site, breaking it out into uh, residential plus retail, sort of uh, more of an open air main street type of retail, and uh, adding that residential component that we think is so important to give new life to what historically had been just um, large indoor malls surrounded by parking. And uh, this is uh, a really innovative project. I think it is going to be um, a model for other places in the country. It's been discussed in other places, but it hasn't really been implemented yet. Um, but we're uh, very happy that this is moving forward in uh, Montgomery County. Uh, next. I'm just quickly listing our other projects. There are so many others from master plans like Ashton and Shady Grove that you're going to be seeing this winter and that uh, you'll be having public hearings on. Ones that we're just really getting started like Silver Spring Downtown and adjacent communities, Tacoma Park, Great Seneca Science Corridor Minor Master Plan Amendment, Farallon Bridge Cheney. And we have a whole group of studies, both transportation related like Corridor Forward and the Pedestrian Master Plan, but other uh, important studies like uh, mixed use development study that our research and special projects division is doing. Uh, next. So here's our schedule. It says fiscal year 22, but this is actually fiscal year 21. I apologize that this is mislabeled, but um, this is our schedule for fiscal year 21. You can see that uh, in the very near future, probably later this month, you're going to be receiving our complete street design guidelines and our Shady Grove sector plan uh, so that you will have some work to do over the winter before uh, you get into your budget work and that uh, you'll be getting Thrive Montgomery to take up after your budget work um, and that we have, again, uh, plenty of work coming forward over the next uh, year. We will be developing a, an additional work program for fiscal year 22, which we will share with you during our spring semi-annual and as part of our budget discussions for fiscal year 22. And that is the end of my presentation. I think we're now on to the parks presentation and Mike Riley. Good afternoon, Council President Katz and Council members. I'll just wait a second till Pam gets the parks slides up.
Okay. Could you go back to the uh, opening slide, Pam? Okay, you're looking at a picture of uh, Sligo Creek Parkway on a Saturday in May. I took this personally, uh, took this photo personally. I spent a lot of time out on our open parkways on Sligo uh, Beach and Little Falls, uh, seeing a lot of idyllic scenes where our community members were out uh, exercising for their own uh, physical health and mental well-being, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So next. So here's we, where we were uh, back in April of this year. Uh, we closed all of our 303 tennis courts. They're relatively easy to close comparatively. You can, they have fences and gates and you can put a lock and chain around them. Uh, we removed uh, rims for most of our basketball courts wherever we had uh, observed or reported violations of the uh, health orders, we would uh, swoop in and uh, remove the rims. And then uh, we closed uh, all of our 276 playgrounds with a uh, combination of fencing and tape that required quite a bit of uh, labor. Of course, we captured all of this, uh, these uh, labor and material costs in our enterprise asset management system. That uh, photo in the upper center uh, shows our uh, Microsoft Power BI dashboard, so I could monitor our costs in real time. And uh, just one data uh, piece of data, just the, the uh, closure of the uh, playgrounds and the, the labor and the material for the fence costs just about $65,000. Next. Here's where we are today. We've had a heavy reliance on uh, infographics uh, throughout the pandemic to communicate to all our park users and patrons what they can do and what they uh, can't do. Of course, it's fluid and we're modifying it all the time. Uh, this shows you that uh, there's a lot of things that are open, uh, some with modifications or limitations. Uh, but you see some of the things there that are still closed because they're either indoor building activities or high risk activities that uh, the health orders uh, don't uh, don't want us to do. Next. Just some more. I'm not going to talk about these. These are just examples of infographics we've used. Uh, they were all translated into English and Spanish, uh, and we've used them extensively both uh, physically out in the parks, on our website, uh, and social media, and in other applications. Next. So we've tried to be really creative and innovative in designing safe activities and programs for our residents and uh, their children to enjoy. Um, sometimes we plan and manage these ourselves. Sometimes we partner with uh, community organizations or other government agencies. So I'm just going to highlight uh, several of these events over the next few slides. Uh, the group at Brookside came up with this idea of stand-up weddings. They permitted groups of 20 or less to just come onto the wedding, uh, onto the grounds, and host a stand-up wedding. They didn't have to close the gardens. Uh, they didn't allow caterers or tables or chairs. You just uh, came in with your family or your guests and your your uh, your minister, and you uh, you could have your wedding because people still need to get married, <laughs> even though we have a pandemic going on. So we had. Um, 45 stand-up weddings since July and at Brookside and then at our other uh, event venues, including Rockwood and Seneca, we had 26 uh, weddings within the parameters of the health orders that were in place at the time. Uh, Drive-in movie nights, we had uh, two at Wheaton Regional Park with a 35 car capacity and two at South Germantown with a 47 car capacity. They both sold out within two hours of going online. And then the last group of photos, our Halloween hustle at Black Hill Regional Park was uh, themed 5Ks uh, that uh, had time slots limited to 40 people and it had 118 total participants. Next, please. Uh, we hosted Active Aging Week at Brookside Gardens in concert with uh, Montgomery County Health and Human Services. That lower picture is a pro, uh, on your left is a, a cool program called Walk with a Doc, where we have walks with uh, local doctors where people get to ask how, any health questions that the doctors can order. And the right grouping of pictures uh, is really a DOT uh, uh, project, but it's uh, right next to Acorn Park where we have a picnic in the park. As you know, DOT did 
institute a uh, closure of Newell Street, and uh, I've been seeing an awful lot of activity on social media of uh, people enjoying that space. As you can see from these photos, there's actually people dancing in the street. Next. Here's just uh, some feedback we got about the Newell Street closure. I certainly won't read it to you, but uh, we've, we've gotten more like this, that people are communicating to both DOT and to the Parks Department that they, uh, they really enjoy and like this space and this idea. Okay. Just a few more examples of our adaptable program. We did a Halloween uh, walk and chalk on Sligo Creek Parkway in partnership with the City of Tacoma Park on uh, Halloween where the kids were uh, chalking on the, uh, the roadway in the parking lots. Uh, we've utilized uh, COVID Core for several projects, which is the Recreation Department's um, Youth Employment Program. And we also partnered with uh, Mid-Atlantic Mid Off-Road Enthusiasts to do Discover Montgomery, which is a virtual hiking, biking, and running challenge designed to get people outdoors and exploring our trails. And then, of course, like everybody else, a lot of things we couldn't do in, uh, physically we did online. There's a list of uh, things here. Uh, I won't go over them all, but I'll just uh, thank Council Member Juando on the last one. He participated in virtual story time with us, which uh, I know had a lot of activity out there on social media. And I'll just also add that uh, our summer camps, even though they were virtual, were, uh, fill, were uh, filled up fast. And uh, the next slide, I think, will show you an accolade we got from a parent who, whose child attended two of them. Uh, this is uh, feedback from a parent whose child attended our Nature Girls virtual camp held at Black Hill and our Rock Creek Ecology virtual camp held at uh, Meadowside. Uh, nature Center. Next. Uh, so during the pandemic, we began partnering with Harvest Share to recover fresh, fresh produce from three of our community gardens, uh, Rocking Horse Community Garden, Briggs Cheney Community Garden, and the South Germantown Community Garden. Harvest Share is an initiative that asks backyard and community gardeners to grow a little more in their own gardens and donate the extra produce to community resources dedicating to reducing food insecurity in, uh, in our county. So far, the Parks Department has donated 120, 420 pounds of produce to contribute to the total of 5,000 uh, 5, pounds of produce collected by Harvest Share just since July 2020. Next. So a couple slides on the theme of supporting a local business. You know that the Parks Department has many public-private partnerships that leverage resources of both uh, nonprofit and for-profit entities uh, so we can provide serve that, that provides services we may not otherwise uh, be able to supply is something uh, these partnerships are something we're very uh, proud of. Uh, many of them, of course, had to cease or limit operations and experienced significant loss of revenue. So we established fair and consistent standards upon which we would agree to forbear rent. Uh, to date, 18 lessees have received $240,000 in rent abatement uh, during this period with no expectation for repayment. Uh, you see a chart here. The largest amount is attribute to, attributed to the loss of two ball field seasons at the uh, Shirley Povich Field in Cabin John Park. And the second largest amount uh, represents uh, the indoor uh, tennis facility at uh, South Germantown Recreational Park. Uh, we did this uh, consistently with our uh, colleagues over in Prince George's Parks and Recreation who, who have a lot of um, uh, partnerships as well. And again, the whole uh, idea here was to be consistent and fair to everybody and hopefully keep everybody in business. Sticking with the uh, next slide, please. Uh, and sticking with supporting businesses, uh, my team came up with the picnic in the park idea in partnership with Visit Montgomery. I'm sure you're all familiar with the MoCo Eats uh, website and that effort to support our local restaurants. Uh, so in nine park locations, uh, we uh, uh, set up a, a, an app where you could go out there and, and uh, scan the QR code. It takes you to the MoCo Eats website. You can pick your restaurant and uh, either have the food de delivered to the park or, of course, you can always do carry-in. Uh, we got quite a bit of uh, public and media attention when we decided to allow uh, alcohol in these areas. As you know, alcohol is 
in generally not allowed in the public parks, but uh, we thought we would get more participation if we allowed people to consume alcohol with their uh, with their lunch or their dinner. And I'm very pleased to report, despite a lot of concerns, we have had no negative incidents uh, so far uh, related to the allowance of alcohol in these nine spaces. Next. Switching gears quite a bit, um, we did uh, develop a racial equity lens in preparation of our uh, fiscal year uh, 21 to 26 CIP. I do believe the Parks Department plays a key role in helping the council meet its uh, racial equity and social justice goals. Uh, we already put in place a methodology to factor capital investment through an equity lens that factors income and race. Uh, park and recreation agencies across in major cities across the country have implemented equity lenses in prioritizing their investment. Uh, and we are studying the methodologies of those uh, agencies across the country. So our tool is a GIS-based tool developed by parks uh, and planning. Just want to thank uh, Gwen Wright and the planning department for teaming on this. And um, Jay Cole, our division chief, who's pictured here, uh, recently gave a talk at the National Recreation and Park Associations Conference about uh, how, our, how we're applying our equity lens and comparing it to the equity lens of major park and recreation agencies uh, across the county. If you slip to the next, switch to the next slide, you'll just see some of the agencies that we are uh, talking to. Uh, and uh, again, there, this is very common across the country that parks and recreation agencies, which really have always been grounded in, uh, in equity, are, are really advancing their, their racial equity lens. One interesting case in New York City, what they did um, is they simply went back 20 years and they calculated their total capital investment in every one of their parks over the last 20 years. And if it fell below a certain uh, threshold, they would conclude that there was disinvestment in that community. And they did a huge bond sale and went out and improved all those parks that fell below that threshold of a particular level of investment. But uh, all these different uh, uh, cities have different twists and we're trying to uh, uh, imitate the best of the best. Next. I won't talk much about the athletic fields. I just relied heavily on pictures to do the talking here. A lot of before and after pictures of our program. I just, with the resources you have provided us for the staff and the equipment, uh, we've been able to build considerable expertise and get out there and do a lot more fields than we uh, have done in the past. Uh, in the middle, you see uh, White Oak uh, Rec Center that was uh, renovated this summer, thanks to money. You provided us uh, through the budget, um, and with that, we'll be covered in growth blankets over the winter, and then hopefully by late spring, we'll pull them off, and there will be a lush green stand of uh, Bermuda grass at White Oak for that uh, community to enjoy. Uh, next slide. Just more before and afters. The one at Rock Creek Forest Elementary shows you how bad uh, a poorly built and maintained elementary school can get before we come in and maintain it. That is not a, uh, an unusual situation at some of the elementary schools. So we are confident that once we renovate the field and put it on our maintenance program, it will uh, sustain itself much better than the fields have in the past. Next. Just a few more before and afters and I'll move on. Uh, that one in the center shows you that in addition to improving turf and field conditions, we go in and we try to um, alter amenities like player seating to make them easier to maintain and more accessible to lower our costs going forward. Next. This is a slide I update every six months. It just shows them some of the major projects that have come online or coming online. Uh, some of them I have future slides I'm going to talk about. I will talk a little bit about Maydale. Uh, Clarkmont is a develop, developer built park and cabin branch community. Uh, Pinecrest is a park refresher in, Silver, in the Four Corners area of Silver Spring. You know all about the Wheaton headquarters. Uh, Dewey Local Park is a park refresher that's completed. I will talk about. I will also talk about the Henson Museum, and then uh, Piedmont Woods is another developer-built park in uh, Clarksburg that's uh, going to come online very soon. These are parks where, through the development process, we leverage not only the acquisition of the parkland but uh, got the developer to build the park in its entirety as well. 
next. So now I'll highlight just a few of those projects. Uh, well, Wheaton headquarters was our first lead platinum building. We now have our first net plus building. Uh, that means it will produce more energy over the course of a year than it will use. Uh, the building is a repurposed trailer from our old maintenance depot that is now located or co-located, I should say, with the MCPS maintenance depot and food service building out at the uh, green farm. So that was the, the old trailer is the, the, the core of the building. And then uh, we built a wraparound deck uh, that is covered in solar, solar, plan, solar panels. Uh, we have gray water flushing uh, toilets that is harvested from rainfall on the roof and stored in an underground uh, 275 gallon system. We have tram walls uh, in the front and back of the facility that retain passive solar heating and many more amenities. But uh, this, is, uh, this is already uh, being uh, programmed for outdoor activities and uh, I think will be very popular amenity or is already a very popular amenity in the East County. Next, uh, this is a park refresher uh, completed this summer. It is, uh, we, we love to uh, promote this idea of public facility co-location. This is one because it sits on top of WSSC's 5 million gallon uh, Rock Creek uh, sewage storage facility. Uh, it's a project I actually worked on personally when I first came to the Parks Department in uh, the 80s. And uh, now my original projects are reaching life cycle and need to be uh, redone. So <laughs> this one was just recently redone after just a little bit more than uh, 30 years. My staff did a great job. It uh, features um, a, uh, a street hockey uh, futsal court that developed in partnership with the Washington Capitals, a uh, large dog park that is divided into a large dog area and a small dog area, uh, an outdoor gym, a multi-age themed playground, uh, picnic shelters, and a really, really neat track that goes around the uh, uh, Washington Capitals rink where kids like to either roller skate or bike or ride their scooters in a loop around the track. And uh, you see a, a, a mural that was painted on some of the WSSC infrastructure uh, by one of our, our local artists. And I just want to really, I always like to plug the park refresher concept. We're trying to do these uh, equitably distribute uh, the resources we have uh, among our communities and do these projects uh, faster at a, at a lower cost than some of the marquee projects we've done in the past. So this may be the most important project uh, I've had the pleasure of working on during my career. Uh, we're just about to open. Uh, I don't think it could be coming online at a better time, uh, telling the story of Henson's enslavement, his path to freedom, and his return to help others uh, achieve their freedom. Uh, the project uh, features a new 3,000 square foot uh, visitor center that you see pictured in the upper left with a retail area, uh, theater, uh, an outdoor terrace, and a fully restored 3,000 foot historic house with, uh, with the log kitchen and second floor offices. The photo on the lower left is our museum manager, Cheryl Spicer, and uh, our former first lady, uh, Catherine Leggett, who is uh, through the Park Foundation, uh, been our capital campaign chair to raise money. And then the photo in the lower center is uh, Cheryl with Mia Lewis, who is a descendant of Reverend uh, Josiah Henson. And we gave her uh, a tour recently. Uh, we sadly had to postpone a planned uh, December ribbon cutting when the new health order came out. We were trying to do so something within the 50 person limit, but we thought with the uh, pandemic numbers worsening, it was not wise to go forward with any type of uh, ribbon cutting ceremony, but we do expect sometime in January that we will open to the public. Uh, guests will be able to make reservations to visit through Active Montgomery. We'll have a maximum of five slots available for each 30 minute session during the day. And guests will begin their experience to the visitor center by viewing a 13 minute orientation video. Then guests will be directed to the historic home where they will proceed on a safe guided experience. And the experience then ends with a visit to the detached log cabin that uh, people associate so much with the book, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Next, please. 
Uh, this is a boat launch we did at uh, Seneca Landing. The need for an accessible uh, boat launch was initiated by a group called Team uh, River Runner. They're a nonprofit organization that provides adventure and adaptive paddle sports to veterans on their families. Uh, they approached Montgomery County Commission on Veterans Affairs about the need for an accessible launch and were assisted by the commission uh, to initiate the project. Uh, on Sundays from May to November, the group uh, hosts a kayak program at Seneca Landing with patients from Walter Reed National uh, Military Medical Center, as well as veterans from the community. And uh, two gentlemen you see pictured here, one is a 25-year uh, veteran of the United States Navy, and the other is an 85-year-old uh, Marine uh, who is a, a member of Team River Runner. Next. Wheaton Regional Park Master Plan update is underway. This is something we don't do that often. Now it's our largest down county park and it's the first time we've revisited the master plan in uh, 30 years. We're trying our best to outreach to everyone. Um, some of our efforts include uh, and it, uh, targeting multiple audiences, uh, converting our, our uh, messaging to multiple language, English, Spanish, and Mandarin. We've got bus, uh, metro, and cell phone ads going on, online and in-person community surveys. We've already got 1,200 responses, which is very good. Uh, community uh, group work sessions with a, a bunch of different community leaders. Uh, focus groups with diverse audiences adjacent to the park uh, and virtual presentations to as many organizations as we can get to. So we're, uh, we're doing our best to creatively hear from everyone about what they would like to see this really important uh, park in our down county evolve into in its next iteration. Next. Pickleball, uh, I'm sure you've all heard about pickleball. It's uh, now joined dog parks, skate parks, and in, uh, in, uh, in our high-need uh, facilities. Um, it's a very fast-growing sport, particularly with our older generation. We've been adding them uh, to the system wherever we can. Uh, next slide, please. This just shows uh, a pickleball, retrofitted pickleball court on a tennis court. And on the right, our guys putting the uh, new lines down. Uh, so to date, uh, we have pickleball facilities at six parks, Bower Drive, Longwood, Meadowbrook, Olney Mills, Tilden Woods, and East Norbeck. But we are working hard to uh, add additional pickleball opportunities in the park system wherever we can. Moving on to trails, uh, these um, on the left, you see some of the major projects uh, that are underway. On the right, uh, the bar charts show increases in trail usage between 2019 and 2020 for the period January to November in each year at four different locations. Uh, two of them are on the Capitol Crescent Trail and two of them on the, are on the Rock Creek Trail. The left column of bars shows bicycle usage while the right column shows pedestrian usage. Uh, one data point, as you can see, shows that bicycle usage essentially doubled on the Rock Creek Trail at Baltimore Road between 2019 and 2020. Uh, these numbers clearly show that our trails have been import an important refuge for our residents during the period which many other activities were restricted. And this is just one example of uh, where we're trying to use data and analytics to better manage our uh, extensive park system. Here's one project I just want to highlight, the Cabin John Natural Surface Trail renovation this summer in Cabin John, just south of uh, I-495. We replaced a hiking only trail that was located in a floodplain with a new multi-use trail that accommodates equestrians, mountain bikes, and hikers. Uh, we try to make our uh, trails, uh, particular people's choice trails that uh, may be in floodplains or wetlands, we're going back and making them more sustainable with uh, improved uh, design and construction methods. Uh, on this project, I want to do thank uh, Council Member Friedson for coming out and touring the project and uh, meeting our trail crew while it was uh, under construction. I regret I, I, I meant to have my staff put a photo of him operating that mini excavator. We did uh, allow him on that for a while. I forgot to check whether he had a commercial driver's license uh, or not, but uh, next time I'll come back with a, a photo of, uh, of Council Member Friedson on the, the mini excavator. Just a few more slides and I'll be done. 
So uh, as you know, back in April, we uh, initiated an open parkways program to close portions of Sligo Beach and Little Falls to motor vehicles. Uh, between April and November, uh, there were more than 480,000 visits to, across the three parkways. We know this because we have uh, a couple different types of automated counters at uh, various locations that can differentiate uh, bicyclists from uh, pedestrians. And uh, participation has, has actually exceeded our expectations and the feedback on the program uh, from community members has been overwhelmingly positive. I wanna commend my uh, trails team for coming up with these creative stencils that they painted on the pavement of the uh, parkways and the trails. You see one uh, here in the, in the slide and uh, the one I didn't display that was my favorite uh, was called uh, No Trail Gating. And this is picture is Little Falls Parkway, by the way. Next. So when we decided to uh, open the parkways to people and close them to cars, we realized our gates uh, were made to keep cars out, not to let people through. This is one of uh, the more egregious example on Sligo at the uh, old Carroll Ave Bridge, where you can see on the right uh, what people had to force their way through and uh, have to go through the mud and certainly couldn't social distance. So we immediately mobilized our tradespeople to come out and uh, brainstorm on ways to fix it. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see how we uh, fixed this one. And uh, across Sligo and Beach, our uh, outstanding uh, trade staff uh, did install four new gates and uh, retrofitted nine gates to improve pedestrian and bike bicycle access. Of course, that wasn't free. There were labor and material costs. And it's just one of many, many examples of how in uh, trying to provide an outdoor venue for our residents, we did have to incur costs uh, to make it work. So that's it. Here's uh, two happy guys doing the inaugural closing of uh, Beach Drive. Of course, we're fully masked and standing uh, six feet apart. Uh, as I said, this has uh, been a very successful program that I'm thrilled about. I happen to live in this community right near here and uh, all the feedback I've got uh, and what I see is, uh, is uh, just uh, wonderful. There's so much more I could have talked to you about. I could have talked to you about the success of our enterprise fund and program. I could have highlighted our vision zero accomplishments, our urban park acquisitions, uh, but uh, the breadth of what we do in the parks department is uh, so extensive. I'll save some of those for the next six months and I just thank you for your time and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very, very much. Um, Mr. Anderson, does that complete your presentation? Yes, I want. Uh, thank you. I wanted to see, I know we had a couple other planning board members who were planning on logging in. I don't know if they were successful or not, but I, if you wouldn't mind, I just wanted to see if they're here and would like to say a few words. I know Jerry had texted me and said he was having a little trouble logging in, but uh, Pratap and Tina might be on. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I can see whether they're online or not. Yeah, I don't see their names, but. Okay. Well, with, with that, I think we're done. I, I think what I'd say just in wrapping this up is I hope it's clear from seeing this that we really have tried to take this pandemic as an opportunity to try to see what we could do to innovate and get better both in the Parks Department and the Planning Department. The outreach that we've done with planning, some of the things that we've done with the uh, uh, open parkways with parks and some of the experimenting with food and alcohol. I think these really highlight how our staff have taken this challenge on with a lot of energy and enthusiasm at a time when we would have had every excuse to just, you know, say, you know what, there's a pandemic going on. We can just dial it down and just try to muddle through. And that's not how this organization has responded. I'm proud of everybody uh, that, wor that works for us for everything they've done to try to meet the needs of the pandemic and see what uh, silver linings we could find in. And I hope that's come through in this presentation because I feel very strongly that we have performed at a very high level and I, I just can't say enough about uh, the people who, who work for us. I'm just uh, very excited to come into work every day to work with these people. Well, thank you. And we can't say enough either. You know, the the uh, at the the last slide there was four thumbs up i think you can get 18 thumbs up from the montgomery county council i mean we're all very very happy and pleased that that uh that of all the hard work that you do and especially during all the time 
but especially during these most difficult times. And, and um, I did, there's several council members that want to speak, but I think on behalf of a, of a very appreciative Montgomery County, you, you, uh, you, you all are always there. And one of the things that I've often said is when someone does such a good job, you take it for, you, you take it for granted. And that's exactly, in some cases, that's exactly what we do. We take it you for granted. We take the, the employees for granted because we realize that it's just going to get done the right way. And, and you keep Montgomery County beautiful and you keep Montgomery County green. And for that, we're most appreciative. With that, we're going to call on uh, Council Member Friedson, who I believe is a, uh, the, the council lead on, on parks. So please, Council Member Friedson. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I've just got to say that uh, seeing this presentation and throughout this crisis, it's really made me proud to have that designation and uh, to be able to safeguard the 37,000 acres of parkland and our 422 parks. And always such an important part of the quality of life in Montgomery County. But I think during this pandemic in particular, uh, it has really uh, risen in its importance and demonstrating just how valuable uh, and necessary it is for quality of life and for mental health and for exercise and uh, for so many different people in so many different ways. And so I just uh, really wanted to, to, to state that. I appreciate uh, you, Mr. Riley, mentioning the uh, mini excavator. Uh, and I appreciate uh, you and your team, particularly the the expert trails team humoring me by letting me ruin their work for a few minutes and then waiting until I was out of sight uh, before they went back and fixed all the damage that I had done <laughs> to the Cabin John trail. But it sure was a lot of fun for me to hop up on that uh, mini excavator. And I will say I, I now use that trail all the time uh, at Cabin John. It's one of the many trails uh, throughout the county and you know, it's really been a, a, a huge asset uh, to me and to so many. And um, you know, it, it, I've loved the opportunity throughout this crisis to, to get people new trails to go hike and to bike and to uh, enjoy. And it really has been something that I think more and more residents have taken advantage of because it is such a great uh, opportunity. Uh, I am really bummed about the Josiah Henson uh, opening, and I was really looking forward to that. I had December 5th. I circled about 100 times on my calendar uh, I'm probably looking forward to that more than anything that's opening uh, in Montgomery County. I've been able to uh, stop by and see the uh, progress during the construction process. And uh, it's just something that I think our whole county should be so proud and so appreciative of the expertise within parks, which I also think we sometimes take for granted the uh, historical expertise that you and your team have. And uh, just uh, talking for a few moments with, uh, with those folks to understand uh, just how much they know about our local history. This is going to be such a tremendous asset to our young people in particular, but to all of our residents. I hope that every single Montgomery County resident will go and visit uh, that. And uh, it's such a great example, particularly in this moment, as you mentioned, uh, of reclaiming history in the words of the person uh, that had been perverted over time, I think. Uh, Josiah Henson's story is, uh, has, 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 has not been told the way that it uh, was in the way that it should be, and I think you uh, are, are, are going to do that justice, and I really uh, do uh, appreciate that. Um, and I'm also bummed, uh, you know, I don't want to rain on uh, Councilmember Navarro's parade here in Wheaton, but uh, the, the um, Garden of Lights at Brookside Garden uh, being canceled this year as well, always something that I know all of us look forward to, and I'm uh, upset about that, but I appreciate the fact, given that these things are changing how you've adapted and adjusted. I think the picnic in the park has been really successful. Appreciate you taking feedback on that. There were, uh, you know, resident issues and concerns that you all were, uh, you know, listened to and, and heard, which is uh, much appreciated. But uh, it just shows the adaptive uses that our parks uh, have and the way that we need to rethink uh, what they are and what they can be and, and what they do uh, for our residents, uh, which I appreciate. And I will just say, to our local park and uh, the uh, the rink there has been utilized uh, a few times, and I'm no longer playing ice hockey indoors because of public health reasons, but I uh, appreciate the fact that that's there for uh, casual uh, use as well. It has been a great partnership with the Parks Foundation, which I think shouldn't be lost here either, the involvement of our local 
residents who really step up and work with you and your team to uh, figure out ways to, uh, you know, to, to, to get resources and uh, to help to, to, to provide those uh, efforts. And then the last thing on parks that I just wanted to say, uh, it was noted quickly through this, but I think it really should be highlighted here. Parks has been a great landlord during this crisis and um, you know, really have stepped up to help your tenants, has been a leader uh, on that uh, issue of uh, demonstrating uh, the challenges that uh, folks are facing. And I, I really think you've led by the power of your example, and that's uh, really noteworthy, something that I hope that uh, we will uh, emulate across the board. I think it really shows well for the county. It shows well for the Parks Department. I just wanted to uh, note and appreciate that. Um, uh, and also the open streets, I think. Um, I've taken quite a bit of advantage uh, of the open streets. I think it's a model. It's an example that parks and uh, park and planning has really led uh, where, um, you know, the county with our streeteries and other uh, areas have been able to take this crisis, as, uh, as Chair Anderson said, and uh, see what opportunities there are. Start with yes and figure out how to get there as opposed to starting with no, which is what uh, too often times in government uh, we get caught up in and you have really led the way uh, on that, uh, demonstrating that streets are for people and that we should uh, push the envelope in how we utilize our assets to serve uh, residents, which I appreciate. And on the planning side, I just wanna thank you. It's, it's exciting to see, it's not just what uh, we are and how we get through this current moment, but how we build the foundation for the moments that follow uh, to come out of this. And I think uh, planning really is planning for that. And it's exciting to see that there is continued progress uh, that is happening uh, on the planning side. And I think the growth and infrastructure policy that we uh, passed uh, this week uh, will help to build upon that as was noted. I'm really excited about uh, what that's gonna mean for the future uh, of uh, Montgomery County. And so just wanted to uh, note that as well. Uh, just quick question before I end this long rant about how much I love our parks and how appreciative I am of uh, the planning staff. Uh, if you could just give a quick update on um, the uh, farm women's market and Bethesda and any uh, efforts and conversations that are happening there with the executive branch and the uh, private sector on that. Well, that has been um, quiet for a little while. We had had some um, great conversations and I know Parks is also involved in that uh, about opportunities for um, creation of uh, Elm Street Park and some great open space around the farm women's market. Uh, but I honestly uh, do not know that we have had any additional conversations on that project in the last, I would say three months or so. So waiting to hear back from the executive branch and the applicant. Yes. Got it, okay. Um, Actually, one a last one on Capitol Crescent Park. Do you have an update? Any update there on where things stand with Capitol Crescent Park? That would be a mic question. Yeah, the Capitol Crescent Civic Green. Uh, we had intended to start the planning phase for that in uh, fiscal year 21. Uh, given now that it's you know the the time frame for the Purple Line staging area activities there to cease is kind of unknown and delayed. We're revisiting whether it's really wise to jump into the planning phase in 21, not knowing when we'll be able to start the construction phase. So that's a little bit fluid right now. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you for that update. Obviously, it's a, of huge interest to the community, but I understand the challenges with the connection to the Purple Line and where we go. It's yet another reason why the Purple Line needs to move forward. It needs to stay on schedule because there's so many related impacts on the development side and also on the uh, parks and public amenities side. So hopefully we can uh, move forward on that. There's also the uh, playground and, and public amenity in Elm uh, that is impacted there as well. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. And just thank you again for uh, your continued hard work and uh, efforts in this unprecedented time. Thank you, Councilmember Albert Ellis. Thank you, Mr. President. And I apologize in advance. My four-year-old is having a well-timed meltdown right now, and my earbuds aren't working. So, 
Uh, if you hear something in the background, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I first want to welcome my good friend, board member Natalie Fanny Gonzalez, um, who is such a great leader on so many different letters uh, levels, and I appreciate her great work on the board. Chairman Anderson, Gwen, Mike, and Mike, you got to loosen up, buddy. You don't need a tie with us anymore. Um, appreciate all that you all have done. And I frankly needed this presentation. Uh, we have been dealing with complex, exhausting, and in many cases, depressing issues, um, especially over the last few weeks. And uh, this presentation is frankly a, a ray of light. And all of us have been very concerned about the social and emotional well-being of our residents, particularly our children and youth. And you are part of the solution with the capital S. Um, it is really remarkable uh, what we've been able to stand up and produce. Um, Beach Drive has been a godsend for my family. Uh, we hit it almost every weekend. Uh, my daughter recently learned how to ride her bike on Beach Drive. Uh, and because of the vast open space, we felt super comfortable and confident. And so to Chairman Anderson's point, both planning and parks have put your foot in the gas and continued to carry out your roles of, as public servants in a way that is truly exemplary. Uh, and just a couple of highlights. Um, I, and, and just, I want you to rethink that Josiah Henson uh, opening. I think a virtual ribbon cutting might be pretty cool. Um, I think you could probably pull something off. There are a lot of people who have had that date circled on their calendar and would love to come. If you had a really nice placed video camera uh, and a few people there, I guarantee you there are going to be a lot of people that tune in uh, into something like that. And oh, by the way, if maybe the Montgomery County Parks Foundation did a little infomercial somewhere in there, uh, you might get a little bit of traction too. So just think about that as a former event guy uh, and a former recreation guy. Um, I think that would be really well received and could be a very cool event that I certainly would log into personally. Um, and then <laughs> somewhere my father-in-law is wondering where were stand-up weddings in 2005? 20 people, no catering, in and out of there in an hour. Wow. <laughs> like, and let's keep that going. I've got two daughters, right? Got a long way away, but let's keep that going. That's a pretty good trend. And I'm looking directly at Council Member Rice. Um, and then I, I think that, um, you know, there have been a lot of lessons learned uh, through this. The public private partnerships and collaboration, I think, are so important. And I think we need to actively explore keeping Beach Drive and some of these other closures open beyond the pandemic, uh, because this is now something that has been set as an expectation. And I'll be honest, people are not going to want to go back um, because it's been such a positive uh, element within our communities on so many different levels. And I guess the, the final thing is, and, and Gwen, I appreciate you commenting on you've seen a, a, a large number of people continue to be engaged through the planning board process, maybe even more than usual, that tracks with what we're seeing in the council. And I think this virtual setting, particularly for our immigrant populations and populations who don't feel comfortable or have the time or know where uh, to have their voices heard, that's opened up a wealth of opportunities. And I think there's an opportunity there for the council to work collaboratively with the planning board uh, to double down on that and to do something comprehensive moving forward and make virtual sessions available in addition to in-person once that's appropriate. Um, but I think that will continue to be active because the more engagement we have, the better for all of us. So those are just some general points uh, that I wanted to make, uh, but thank you, all of you, truly, I needed this. Uh, and I defer back to you, Mr. Council President. Thank you, Council Member Reamer. Thanks so much. Um, it's great to be with you again. Uh, it's, yeah, planning and the council have been joined at the hip for weeks now. Uh, maybe we'll get a break from each other soon. I don't know. Um, wanted to just, uh, speak to the importance of keeping the timeline with the general plan. You know, I think we've, we've raised this a number of times, but you know, you, you're hard at work at that now. And, uh, it's, it's a big project. Um, but you know we, we've got to hit that timeline. The longer like delay could result in inaction, 
And you know, you don't start on something like this uh, as as big and significant as this is unless you can finish it. So, um, you know, it's just important for us to just keep that in mind as a council. Uh, invariably, we will begin to hear a drumbeat of uh, you know, voices to say, don't act on it, delay it. You know, there is plenty of time now for people to get engaged in the details. You know, if you want to request amendments of the plan, send that in writing to the planning board if, for the public hearings that are coming up. Uh, send it to the county council if you don't see the change that you're seeking. You know, there's a, an iterative process here, but I um, just want to state, uh, and I'm going to keep saying it, that it's a big, it's a big bite. Um, at the same time, it's a policy document. It's not a rezoning document. It, it shouldn't actually be that difficult, in my opinion. But uh, it's just important for us to to keep it on track. Um, wanted to uh, just, as you know, the COVID situation now is in unprecedented territory, um, and and there's really kind of at the moment, no end in sight of the spike that we're in. So, you know, I hope that you're looking at everything you're doing and, and any way that you can stop indoor gatherings, you should do that now. I think, um, you know, you'll obviously want to hear guidance from the public health officer, but I hope you're preparing for that. I think what's happening now is is a significant concern and, and uh, you know, weddings and things like that need to be even more distanced than ever uh, if they if they happen at all um, and frankly they probably shouldn't but um, you know you're in a unique position as a landlord essentially uh, renting out facilities um, one issue I just wanted to bring to my colleagues attention and and seek a quick comment from the planning uh, from chair Anderson maybe uh, Mike Riley um, the issue of lighting uh, we have spent a, a, a fields athletic fields um, we have spent a lot of time and money uh, to add fields to our uh, portfolio. Um, you know, and it costs a lot of money. It can cost millions of dollars to acquire land and then build a field. Um, but uh, we can actually significantly expand the availability of playing fields by adding lights. And my understanding is we have very, very low level of lighting on our athletic fields relative to other communities. Uh, I think I saw somewhere that Prince George's has like a hundred lit fields. We have like 20 or something like that. Um, and when you get into those fall hours and those spring hours, you know, that's the difference. That's, that's you know, that could be a difference of 50% playing time, you know, for an after school, you know, youth, youth athletic league or team. Um, so I think that's something we need to look again at and um, figure out how to get more lights into our athletic fields, use our schools more. Um, you know, school sites are often a little larger and may be able to host lighting. Um, there may be infrastructure there that we can more easily tap into and so forth. So um, I just uh, wanted to raise that, something I know I've, we've chatted about a little bit, but uh, I think it might have been you know, something that got left behind along the way and, and we could take another look at that. So, Casey. Yeah, well, I, th I think I can safely say uh, that um, the Parks Department is not only open to that, but thinks that's a that's a great idea. I think our issue is, you know, I just, we just had a meeting with OMB this morning where they're, they're, they're sniffing around looking for projects to chop from the capital budget and they're, they're you know, looking under every rock. Um, so, we're just sensitive to not have not lopping off other, you know, important projects. Uh, we'd like to be able to make room for, you know, to try to make some progress. And we were talking about with lighting some fields, but we just need to make sure that we, can, it's not that something we can we can manage within the context of other capital budget priorities at a time when we're already obviously going to be press. So we'd be happy to talk to you uh, offline about what that looks like, but it's not that we're opposed to it. We're just trying to make sure it's I wasn't challenged. suggesting you were. I, really, yeah. I was trying to raise this issue mostly for my colleagues, you know, to, to kind of tune into the fact that maybe there's something we could do here 
that would significantly increase the availability of fields for the community by tackling something that you know is is potentially a lot more affordable uh the, the challenge with it is neighborhood concerns about lighting and i understand that and you know maybe technology has made some strides that can help address some of those questions but you know generally speaking i, I would imagine it is significantly more affordable to light a field an existing field than to buy or renovate you know buy buy land and, and add a field um so i think we ought to just take a, a fresh look at that question we may need a dedicated you know a small dedicated item in the capital budget you know to make funding available i, I, I i'm not really hazarding a guess as to how to proceed uh but just generally that um, i think it's something we ought to take a look at Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Council member Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I really appreciate the, the presentation. As was said, it was uh, a nice moment of levity, seeing all the, the good things that are taking place after all the work that we've been doing today. And uh, notably uh, over the last few weeks, especially if memory serves the 18 or 19 work sessions, uh, council member Friedson, I think it was 18 or 19. Um, so, uh, thank you, 19, Chair Anderson. Yep. 19. Well, that, that, that you participated in. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Anderson, uh, Commissioner Fani Gonzalez, and uh, Directors Wright and Riley uh, for being here. Actually, I like that term, uh, Wright and Riley. It's a good band name. Um, you know, the work to complete Josiah Henson Museum and Park, I think, is really exciting. Uh, and, you know, the suggestion of doing it. Uh, virtually or, or uh, celebrating in some way while we can and, and need more things to celebrate, uh, I think is a good suggestion, um, really good stuff. And then, you know, uh, I know it was glossed over just a little bit, but um, uh, Director Wright, when, when you were referencing and showed the, the slides for the Montgomery Mall project, I, I think that's pretty cool because if memory serves, and clearly the theme here is my memory is not serving, but if memory serves, I think it was the very first council session of this council, the first or second, when uh, we approved council member Reamer's ZTA that facilitated that type of development. Um, so to see what's happened in the last, you know, almost two years, um, exciting stuff. Um, and then, you know, probably the highlight for me of this presentation was uh, learning that we have five pickleball courts uh, here in, in the county. Well, not five courts, but five parks that have pickleball courts, because I, I know plenty of people who actually play that. Uh, so uh, I will definitely spread the word there, and we'll see how quickly those fill up. But um, getting into some of the, the, the meteor substance, I really appreciate Chair Anderson um, saying that this pandemic has provided opportunities to reuse and rethink our policies, right, and operations. And that's something that, that we all have been encouraging county government to do, uh, whether it is procurement processes, HHS, um, government operations uh, across the board and to hear and see firsthand, quite frankly, all the innovative things that you are, are doing, um, planning and end parks as well. Um, this is good stuff. And, you know, unfortunately, we, we know that the, health crisis is not abating. Um, it's only getting worse, at least through the winter time. Uh, and so um, in that vein, as we look towards winter and what's coming down the pike, I, uh, I'm just curious if there are gonna be any updates on the, the open streets effort. You know, I, I walk on Sligo Creek Parkway quite often, um, see people biking and doing other things there as, as well. And so um, if you can share with us uh, either uh, uh, Chair Anderson or, or um, Director Riley, what, what Parks is thinking of doing with, with any more streets here in the county? Yeah, well, we're, I think, about ready to announce um, that during the winter months, we're going to dial back a little bit on the open parkways, uh, but we'll our plan is to continue those indefinitely into the future, not to permanently uh, roll them back, but just recognizing that there's a little bit less usage and that you have less uh, daylight available, uh, you know, and weather obviously will limit in some ways um, the appeal of, you know, being out uh, on those parkways all, all weekend long. But we're going to keep going. And I think the whole thing just demonstrates uh, not only the appeal 
of that project, but also that you can close those parkways and the world doesn't end. So that's been one of the really important things is sometimes, you know, you should never let a crisis go to waste, right? That sometimes when you have a challenge, it enables you to try some things that wouldn't have been considered or would have re encountered a lot of pushback. And I think that the close par the closing the parkways to vehicle traffic has really demonstrated that there is a lot of interest in that on the one hand, and also that traffic does not become unbearable and doesn't create insurmountable uh, logistical problems on the on the other. I did want to add one one firm decision is the Thanksgiving Day holiday. We will open all three parkways on Thursday, so they will be Thursday through Sunday, four days for the Thanksgiving holiday. And I did just uh, I, I've been using the term magical to describe what I'm seeing on these parkways. There's such diversity of use and users. There's lots of novices. There's lots of families and there's lots of small children. And I see a lot of parents with small children either learning to ride or just doing whatever they're doing who have found a place that they're comfortable taking their small children and letting them go a little bit. And they may not have had that place before. So it really... I've enjoyed going out there, not just for my own uh, physical mental health, but to just observe this phenomenon that I had not seen occurring anywhere else in the parks before. So if you haven't been out there on these parkways on peak days, uh, make it a point to get out there. I absolutely agree with you, and I think you just described it beautifully, that what you have helped create here is a magical phenomenon. Uh, and I know that everybody who participates in it um, you see, well, I was going to say you see the smile on their faces, but uh, you can see them smiling under their masks um, and the joy is really there. And uh, I appreciate you closing some of those roadways on Thanksgiving. I will uh, most certainly talk to my husband to see if we can, uh, after Thanksgiving dinner, uh, go and enjoy those parks, those open streetways. Um, and, you know, to the point that Chair Anderson made, um, you know, uh, recognizing that it is getting dark. Uh, and we want to make sure people are safe on those, uh, perhaps that we talk to DOT and figure out if there are ways to uh, encourage more uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety uh, and roadway safety in conjunction with those efforts so that we don't have to pull back as much as um, we might suspect. But, um, you know, bottom line, um, this is a, a wonderful conversation. Keep up the good work, and I uh, will continue to enjoy your, your magical work. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you uh, to Director Wright and to Director Riley uh, and Chair Anderson for your end. Uh, board member Natalie Finley Gonzalez, it's good to see you. Uh, it's been a while. I just, to Gabe's point, Councilmember Rawanos's point, I haven't physically seen you in a while. I just got happy when I saw your face. And um, Mr. Riley, uh, I appreciate the formality, sir you know, uh, coming before the council. You, and you look like you're locked into the cockpit with the headset and everything too. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, and I, I have driven a RV across the country this in August with my family. So I feel like I'm qualified, maybe more so than Councilmember Fritz to move it, get in one of those dirt movers. So I'm gonna have to punch my ticket at some point. Um, but no, seriously, I, this is a great uh, body of work that you all have embarked upon. Uh, very on the list of ribbon cuttings is, is the White Oak Field, which you mentioned, which I'm hoping we can still do. I agree with uh, Councilmember Albernaz that a virtual uh, ribbon cutting for Josiah Henson would be great. Uh, I was very looking forward to that. But I think you're going to have so many people, even on this call, that want to go that might not be able to go. I think we still should do something in person when it's safe to do so, um, no matter what. Um, and, and I think uh, the work that has been done, the ambitious plan that's been laid out, uh, it's been a lot of work. You all have worked very hard and there's a lot more to do. So uh, really appreciate it. I did want to ask just uh, specifically about uh, one thing that um, I know we are all interested in and really appreciate uh, Council Member Friedson on this. I, I sent a letter to the state. He did one locally about the name changes uh, for roads and streets as part of our racial equity work. I just wanted to take this opportunity to get an update on, I know it's not just you all, it was DOT and it's others, but anything that you can share on where that is and how that's going. Yeah, sure. we, uh, uh, there, we have a memo that'll be going to the Fed committee 
uh, probably within the next uh, day or two, certainly by the end of the week, that describes uh, some of what we the work that we've done so far and what we think has remains to be done. And we'll look forward to briefing the Fed committee on that and having conversation with all of you uh, with the idea, I think, that we're coming to the full council in January to discuss that. But I think the plan is, uh, after that memo is sent, to do a Fed committee briefing. Uh, the short answer is that I think we have concluded that it makes sense to address some of these place names in tiers uh, because, and as you'll, as you'll see when you get this memo, there's a lot of complexity um, to trying to differentiate, honestly, be t among different categories of people and, and places and what their significance is. For example, there are many names that are the names of former Confederates that are also common names of people who are not Confederates. In fact, there's a couple examples we found where there are prominent African-American families who shared a last name with prominent Confederates in the same neighborhood, and it's very difficult to untangle. Was the name, was it named after the Confederates or the African-Americans or none of the above? So there's some difficult uh, factual work that needs to be done in untangling the historical record. And then there are also a lot of value judgments to be made about what kinds of uh, conduct or attitudes or, or behavior warrants uh, renaming something that might be a very common um, wayfinding, uh, you know, place name uh, within the county. Just to give you one more example, Dickerson is the name of an unincorporated community in the northern part of the county, as you know. It's also the name of a local park. Uh, the Dickerson family, uh, at least one prominent member of the Dickerson family, I believe, was a, a slave owner. Uh, it raises some questions about do you rename the park but not the unincorporated area or both or neither or you know so there's a lot of of things i think that we'll need to work through with you but our proposal is going to suggest some of what i guess i would characterize for lack of a better term as low-hanging fruit things that we think are obviously should be changed and then there will be additional categories of people and places that i think bear some further discussion and also research. And um, frankly, if we want to go further than that, I think we're going to be looking for some more help with budget to support some more of the research, as well as the logistics of actually uh, uh, getting the renaming done, changing the signage, helping people to change their uh, land records. All the, you know, those you can imagine that this is a lot of things to unpack, but we'll, um, we'll give you some of the early results of our research and thinking, and then we can have a conversation about how you'd like us to proceed. I, I appreciate that. Ms. Wright, did you want to add something or? If... Um, nope, I think that uh, Chair Anderson covered it. I think uh, we have a very, very detailed report to share with you. You'll be getting it very soon. We have sort of short term uh, things that can be addressed in medium and long term. Uh, we're very anxious to, to get to you. As I, as I said, we were supposed to actually brief you all today, but the schedule wouldn't allow it. So we're going to go to the Fed as soon as possible and back to you all, the full council in January. That sounds great. And, and I will just suggest, uh, you know, we have uh, my colleagues and Chairman Reamer and, and Councilmember Friedson that the uh, Reconciliation Commission be involved in, in CC'd at a minimum but maybe even, I think they are, I have been very impressed with the people who are on that commission, the Remembrance and Reconciliation Commission. They have a lot of expertise and research that frankly is free <laughs> that we might be able to leverage and they could take on some of this work and analysis as part of the report. So if you weren't gonna copy them, please do. And, and maybe we even include, you know, include them in the discussion if, if, if we're able to and the chair agrees. But, um, but I think that's, uh, that's great to hear and there's certainly a lot of issues there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to be brief. You heard it from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for everything that you've done. But in addition, thank you for your continued commitment to communities that were underserved and uh, were kind of left out and realized that, hey, we've got to uh, put these communities back, namely a lot of ours in the up county, like Clarksburg, and delivering on infrastructure that was promised to them and never delivered. 
Uh, so thank you. Uh, it really means a lot to those communities and will continue to mean that those are places uh, where folks can live, not just places where their homes are. So thanks. Thank you, Council Member Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, everybody. Uh, I think uh, what has been said is so completely true. I've seen an amazing evolution in the thinking around uh, how do we serve our residents and how do we integrate everyone. It's it's really commendable, and it is awesome to see. It's not that Ifani Gonzalez here, uh, because I know that she has had a lot to do with really guiding some of that work regarding outreach and engagement, which has been so important. Um, and, you know, it has already been said that during this pandemic, the role that our parks have played has been just extraordinary. Um, so I'm really, really pleased with the vision, um, the creativity, the innovation, uh, but more than anything, that alignment where every single one in our county feels like they uh, can partake, that they can be heard, that they can uh, be seen. Uh, and that is super important, especially during these difficult times. So, so thank you so much. And I look forward to all the uh, other kinds of reports that will be coming our way and the amazing work, especially with, with Thrive and also the feedback for uh, Wheaton Regional Park. It's, it's a very exciting time and you guys have done so much even through through this difficult time. So thank you to all the staff and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Hawker. Um, thank you, and sorry I had to step away for a minute, but I uh, just want to reiterate um, the gratitude of uh, so many of my colleagues have already uh, outlined, but particularly um, uh, Casey for your uh, thoughtful comments on the managed lane study and your efforts, uh, and Carol's fantastic work on that, and your you know dedicated efforts to stay in alignment with the position of the county council and the county executive. That made all of our feedback, I think, more powerful. Um, and we have a, a ways to go, but I really appreciate all the hard work that went into that. Um, and I think it's having, having an impact. Um, I also wanted to echo what's been said about the popularity and, and thanks for being so responsive to the constituent requests on the parkway closures um, and the, uh, the open parks program and the open streets program. And also um, for the, uh, uh, Councilman Rice mentioned the up county for the attention to the underserved residents of the East County as well, I'll, I'll add. Um, the uh, the renovation of the White Oak Rec Center, um, the Maydale Nature Center, um, and the Down County Playing Fields have all been uh, big hits, um, and we're uh, we're grateful for your attention to those. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Friedson. Yeah, just as a point of personal privilege to Councilmember Jawanda, I just wanted to point out uh, that I don't know that there's anybody who isn't more qualified than I am to use the mini excavator. So. Uh, he and many others, notwithstanding the trip uh, across the country, and I did, uh, I neglected to uh, acknowledge my good friend, uh, Commissioner Fanny Gonzalez as well. It's great to see you and appreciate all your work engaging so many people in the process and uh, appreciate all of your uh, efforts here. And, and thank you again to the staff and uh, to the rest of the board, Chair Anderson, the colleagues that were on here that had to jump off or couldn't get in. Uh, it really is an extraordinary effort. So thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we're going to thank everyone on the planning board. We're now going to go back to uh, uh, agenda item number six, which is the legislative session day number 35. It's an introduction of bills. The first one is bill 4520, police community policing data. The lead sponsors are council members Joando, Katz, Hucker, and Albernaz. And the public hearing is uh, tentatively scheduled for 12820. Uh, at 1.30 p.m. Um, uh, Council Member Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be very brief. I know it's late in the day um, and uh, we've, we've done a lot. Um, you know, I want to thank you uh, specifically, Mr. President, and your role as president of the Chair of Public Safety, as well as Council Members uh, Hucker and Albernaz, the other co-leads of this police data bill. This came uh, from the OLO report that uh, I had requested and we, we reviewed recently about gaps in our data collection and demographics of, of who is uh, stopped and frisked, for example, who has issued trespass citations, uh, other sorts of custodial stops. And, and it also highlighted some deep disparities in traffic uh, 
who's pulled over, who's issued uh, citations and the like. And so it kind of pointed out that we have some work to do to dig into why we have these disparities on the data we do collect. And it also po pointed out some gaping holes and things that we don't collect. And you can't uh, improve and, and reduce bias uh, in policing or in any system if you don't track it. And so that's what this bill, uh, thank you for uh, to the Office of Legislative Oversight. That's what this bill will do to implement those recommendations and fill those holes and amend the community policing bill that Council Members Navarro and Rice and others put forward that required increased data uh, collection already. So we're really happy to have something to build upon. Um, and so I think this will be really helpful to the Police Advisory Commission, to the Council, to the public. Uh, it requires this to be reported to us every year uh, by February 1st, in addition to all the other data. So uh, really happy to introduce this and appreciate the co-sponsorship. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, certainly, I appreciate uh, Councilmember Juwando recognizing that, um, again, we need to continue. It's interesting. We had this conversation uh, when we first introduced this bill, and it was uh, members of the community that actually were very resistant to us putting forth all different kinds of mechanisms for data collection because they said that they wanted the Police Advisory Commission to come up with those kinds of data collection items. So it'll be interesting to see during the public hearing uh, where those same uh, uh, folks in the community are now. But I certainly support it. I supported it then. And so I'd like to be listed as a co-sponsor uh, because this certainly is something that is in line with 3319 that Council Member Navarro and I tried to do a year ago. Um, but, you know, we're kind of thwarted in our efforts because everybody said you had to wait for the PAC. Um, so I'm more than happy to support this now and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Albernaz. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I think um, this bill in particular, I think, will will help with transparency, but I think it's also gonna help law enforcement. Um, Data-driven decision-making is better for our first responders uh, and will help um, as we deal with very difficult budgets moving forward. But related to that, you know, this can't be an unfunded mandate. Um, we, we have to, as we have, as, as we look at appropriations and as we look at bills, we have to also discuss, and we will throughout the course of the development of this bill, the infrastructure and capacity within MCBD to be able to collect data and information currently, and what more needs to be done to make sure they have the resources necessary to be able to collect this information moving forward, because it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, and so they have to have uh, that, that, that infrastructure. And so similar to what we've done with the Office of Human Rights for other bills and other legislation, um, that is something that I will be looking for uh, as a member of the Public Safety Committee is identifying what we need to do from a resource perspective to put MCPD in the best possible position to be able to collect this information in the first place. So um, it will be an ongoing discussion and I appreciate the collaboration on this particular bill. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Friedson. Yeah, just uh, very briefly, uh, we need to be making data-driven decisions. I think this bill will help us uh, move in that direction. It continues work that has been done and will continue to be done. And I'd like to be uh, added as a co-sponsor. I think I requested it, but I think I might have been uh, after the fact, so I didn't make it onto the agenda. So I just wanted to formally request it here if it hadn't been noted prior. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Navarro. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, this is a, a very good step forward. I think that as we embark in this very ambitious work, uh, there's always going to be opportunities to enhance what we've done. And um, as it was mentioned before, uh, this definitely came up when we were deliberating on the community policing bill. And I think Olo did such a great job uh, at uh, really identifying some pieces. Uh, so um, I don't know that I have received any uh, particular communication, but we've been doing so much uh, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity to, to ask to be added as a co-sponsor because I do think that uh, this very much enhances a lot of the steps that we have taken forward thus far and data is always really important. To Councilman Malbernos's point, I also do have some concerns about capacity. And so I hope that at the, um, appropriate time that we uh, also address this because there's no point in, you know, adopting legislation and mandates if our folks don't have the capacity to put this forward. So, so we'll have to work on that together. And uh, thank you, Councilmember uh, 
Jawando uh, and everyone who, who worked on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Glaes. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, thank you, Councilmember Jawando and the Public Safety Committee. Uh, you know, if we want to improve ourselves, uh, we need the data to help guide us that way. And so that's what this this legislation uh, is is geared towards. And, and for that reason, I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. Thank you, Vice President Hawker. Uh, same thing, I wanna thank Council Member Jawando and my colleagues on the Public Safety Committee um, and all the staff at the OLO who worked on this um, for the research and the findings um, that will help us guide our recommendations on you know constitutional policing, community policing, racial equity, and social justice. Um, I think the bill ultimately when, we, when it passes will uh, give our community advocates um, more confidence in how seriously we take um, uh, our policy making in this area. Um, but as, as Gabe said, um, it, it'll be really, uh, I think, beneficial to our hardworking officers as well. We ought to be making policy on, on based on data and not based on anecdotes. Um, this will, I think, lead the public to have more confidence in our policy making in this area, which that's important in every area, but it's particularly uh, important uh, in, in, in law enforcement policing matters where there's life or death and, um, and uh, issues of individual freedom that, uh, that we, we just need the public to be very confident in our decision making. So this is gonna help get us there. Thanks uh, to all of you for your support. Thank you, Council Member Reamer. Thank you, just wanna be added as a co-sponsor as well. Thank you, so that is now introduced there again, the public hearing is tentatively scheduled for um, December 8th at uh, 1.30 p.m. The next bill uh, um, for, to be introduced is Bill 4620, which is the police school resource officers prohibited. The lead sponsors are Councilmember Juwando and Councilmember Reamer. The public hearing is tentatively scheduled for January the 12th, 2021 at 7.30 uh, in the evening. And Council Member Jawando, please. No. Okay. Uh, I was going to let, it doesn't matter. Council Member, would you like to go first and I can, yeah. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. I'll go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, team effort. Um, okay. We're, we're introducing this legislation today and, and certainly inviting our colleagues to co-sponsor the bills with us, uh, the bill with us. Um, I think this is really important legislation, and my my conviction around this issue has grown a lot over the past year and a half or so. As as I think we've really grappled more and more uh, with our approach to public safety and policing, and we've heard more and more from students um, about concerns about uh, having police officers in schools. I think I understand the program, uh, you know, a lot better than I used to, and. Um, you know, I guess my view is that police officers are there to make arrests, and that's what how principals use them. And, you know, that's the system that we've built. Uh, we've built a very effective system to, uh, you know, allow for quick arrests when there are problems. And we have a police officer in every high school. Um, I, I really think we need to take a different approach and find an alternative way to address incidents and I recognize that there are at times serious incidents um, that may yet require a police officer to come to the school uh, if there is a serious violent incident or a serious threat. But as a general matter, I just don't believe that we need to use, rely upon officers making arrests that we can find other t ways to engage with the students that are you know, committing uh, are involved in incidents and uh, bring the school community, the parent community, and the educator community together in, in a bigger vision, um, a, a fundamentally a restorative justice vision. And we've we've already talked a bit about the appropriations uh, that are before us. And I know Councilmember Juana will speak to um, all these issues. But when you look at what happens to kids who are arrested in the criminal justice system, you will see a, dis a disparate treatment. So it's not only that black and brown kids are more likely to be arrested, it's that once they are arrested, uh, the, 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 way, the outcomes are different. And I just think that is a significant issue. And I think we have to, to grapple with that. So, um, you know, I, I think what we are doing today is, is relying 
too much on policing. I think it's harder to take on a different approach uh, to build a different system, but I think we ought to do it. And uh, I really appreciate uh, partnering with Council Member Juwanda to uh, bring this bill forward. We are we know the school system is preparing its recommendation and will receive that within the timeline of this legislation. Um, but uh, let's work together to, to break the cycle for students and, and make sure that we do not have a school to prison pipeline in Montgomery County um, and, and find a better approach. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Juwando. Thank you, uh, round two here. Thank you, Councilmember Reamer. It's uh, great to partner with you on this bill. Um, I just wanna underscore a couple of points. We, we've had a versions of this debate uh, and discussion and it's an important one. And I appreciate all my colleagues engaging in it uh, from a really a, a place of concern and care for our community. Um, and I, I really believe that. Um, I think that this program and much like quick programs across the country uh, was created with the best of intentions. But when you look at the data, and I think we just talked about introducing a data driven bill, the data we have about the outcomes as a result of police in schools and arrests by SROs individually, uh, whether they be paper or uh, you know handcuffed and taken to the station, are dramatically disproportionate. Um, and that's the data we have. The data uh, on the other side we don't have um, to, to suggest you know and, there, and, to, and of course there are uh, anecdotes and interactions that are positive between a trusted adult, adult who's a police officer who cares about a student uh, and a student. But what we know is that disproportionate harm is happening. We also know, as Councilmember Reamer uh, mentioned, that this uh, school to prison pipeline, the criminalization of black and brown uh, youth in particular, is a significant problem here in the county. Uh, black students are arrested at almost four times the rate of white students. And as was mentioned, once they're arrested, uh, the outcomes become even worse. Black students are, almost, are more than 10 times more likely to be held by the Department of Juvenile Services before their trial as compared to their white peers. Um, just 10 times. They are nine times more likely as their white peers to have their arrest end in incarceration. Um, so it gets worse as you head down the system. And we have to stop every, plug every hole in that system. And schools are one of those many holes because many of our students leave, you know, 55% of our juveniles that are arrested outside of school are black. Uh, so it's a problem outside of school as well. Uh, but when you dig into the offenses, uh, you know, marijuana possession, fighting, uh, disruption, they're things that I know I didn't get thankfully arrested for in school that I did. Um, and, and when there are serious matters, police will always respond in accordance to the law. But we have to remove the proximity that is creating the disproportionate harm. Um, and so I think that's what this bill is about. We talked earlier in the day about uh, making investments in research-based and also data-driven investments in therapeutic services and restorative justice training uh, and, and the like that are shown to reduce the need for school discipline and to be a better approach uh, for supporting all students, not just these students that are disproportionately impacted. And so I think uh, in a time where we have limited resources and where we know disproportionate harm is happening uh, and where we created this program through a federal grant approval and expanded it, we as previous councils, it's our responsibility to step up and do this. And the school board will come with their thoughts and recommendations, but we fund this program. There are police department, it's our role. And I, I think that's an important uh, piece of this. And this is not to say that these uh, officers, again, are bad people or don't care about kids. I know many of them, they do. This is about what is the right trusted adult with the right experience uh, that can interact with our students in a positive way and minimize and eliminate the disproportionate harm that we know is already happening. Um, and, and one of the things that isn't covered in this, and it's and I pushed Dr. Smith on this in our school system, we need to hear the Student Government Association uh, came out in support of this legislation. The uh, Montgomery County Teachers Association came out in support. Uh, there's a Public Defenders Association that have support, and there's a lot of support. And, and it's about how do we re-envision what these officers do. They would not be uh, fired, they would be reassigned, uh, and you could still have a police 
call to the school in accordance with state law. So uh, I know we'll have this discussion over the coming months and really appreciate Councilmember Reamer's partnership and hope that others will co-sponsor and consider the legislation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And I'm going to, there's several council members that want to speak, but I'm going to speak first. You know, I, I, I take great exception to the fact that you said that their job is to make arrests because that is not accurate. Their job is to be mentors. And I have seen it firsthand in, in, uh, in, in high schools, uh, throughout Montgomery County, but, but especially in the Gaithersburg area. They the last in 2018 to 2019, where there was a full year full school year, they made 163 arrests out of the 160,000 students. Last year, where it was only a partial year that they were in the buildings, it's my understanding they made 71 arrests. So we, we need to look at the facts. We need to determine what is the best way. I know that Montgomery County Public Schools right now, just as you do, is having the discussions when re-envisioning what could be and what should be and, and the safety involved with it. But that we need to make certain that our partners, Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, that the Board of Education is a part of this. And for us to have legislation before they can even give their opinion, uh, uh, to say that it would be illegal to have a, a school resource officer in one of their schools, I, I believe is truly is truly uh, uh, unfortunate. I also want to say that you're, I've, I've read, you, know, you didn't mention it today, I've read that you say that this is going to save $3 million, but then you also say today that you're not going to fire any police officers, which I certainly agree with. So how are you saving $3 million? Would you like me to answer that? I would. Uh, so I've spoken to the county executive about this as well. So as I tried to do with the budget savings plan, if you eliminate the positions, you take advantage of open or lapsed positions or and or you don't bring in a new recruitment class. Uh, and you use those 24 or so officers to be uh, beat officers. I mentioned uh, that one of the potential solutions, you could make beats around the high schools that these officers could use their relationships to be the beat officers in those areas and do better community policing and respond if needed. Um, but that's how you do it, be through laps or not taking a, a class in. So that would allow you to actualize the savings. Well. I guess we're going to get into this much deeper, but I, I believe that you don't have a, a, a relationship with someone when they're driving past you in a car. But I do believe you can have a relationship when someone has the time to stand there and talk and be a mentor to. And I'm not saying that the that the exact way that school resource officers have been used in the past in Montgomery County, where they're highly trained, other areas throughout throughout the United States, they have not been as highly trained. But I'm not suggesting that everything is perfect. But what I am suggesting is that we wait to hear from the Board of Education and our partners. And you've mentioned people that are that have been uh, uh, supportive of this. I, I've spoken, and it's my understanding the School Principals Association has come out unanimously against this. So I believe we need to have the good, open, honest, and uh, discussions on it. But I do believe that this is premature legislation. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Katz, and thank you for clearing up some of the uh, mischaracterizations. Uh, but let me just start with a couple others. Um, the idea that many school districts uh, don't have SROs, that's not true. Uh, every single school district in the state of Maryland has some SROs. They may not have one assigned to every single high school, but they have them assigned to schools. It's part of the Safe Schools Act uh, and their adherence to Maryland state law. So that's not true. Um, also, the fact that we have SROs in middle schools, we do not. We approved five additional positions, but those were never deployed uh, and never filled for that position. So we do not. Uh, we still have SROs who still are assigned to middle and elementary schools, uh, those same high school uh, SROs, and go to those particular middle schools and elementary schools that they've always done to do the programming that you mentioned. So I just want to put that out there because, again, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's being said that's not necessarily exactly what happens. And then I'm going to push a little bit harder on the $3 million. Look, the reality is this. We all know, and we fought this battle before, and I'll say this, we being Councilmember Reamer, uh, Councilmember Navarro, uh, and myself, when it came to fighting the reassignment of police officers uh, and how we had to legally uh, allow for the chief to be able to do that. And they're still limited in terms of what they can do. You can't force a school resource officer to be a patrol officer, Councilmember Juwando. 
It just doesn't happen. It's not allowed within union regulations. And so from that perspective, the reality is, is that you can't fill these open positions. You're talking about people who have had 20, sometimes 30 years experience on the force. You're not going to assign them to a rookie patrol position. That's not going to happen. You're still going to have to have a person hired to fill that position. And so, again, I'm not re litigating uh, or relitigating what we already talked about in terms of our budget back in March. Um, if you don't want school resource officers, that's one thing. But let's not put other stuff in to make it seem as though uh, this is justifying it. If you don't believe in it, that's fine. That's perfectly fine, and I'm okay with that. I've talked to plenty of parents and students who don't believe in them, just as I've talked to just as many who do believe in them. So for every student that you can produce that tells me that school resource officers are horrible and they don't want them, I can produce the same number that say that they do. Same with parents, same with administrators, same with teachers. It's the whole nine yards. And I will just remind folks that the last time MCCPTA took a vote on this, they voted to support school resource officers in school. That's our Montgomery County Council of PTAs. That's our Parent Teacher Association. So again, um, I, I think that what I said at the very beginning as chair of the Education and Culture Committee, I believe in a working relationship with our school system. I believe in supporting them in their needs. And certainly if the school system feels as though there's a way in which we need to work together with them uh, to ensure the safety of the students, we should do that. Just as Council Member Reamer said, well, you know, we, we need to make decisions. Yeah, we need to make decisions on how to be creative in terms of supporting our school system, not abandoning them in a time of need when it's difficult. You know, it's important for us to roll up our sleeves and figure out a way to work, you know, together uh, in cohesion with our school board. And so I'm anxious to hear what our school board says, and I will be the first one to cast a vote to take out school resource officers if our school system says that they don't want them. I'm not gonna force something on someone. So let me be very clear, public, I even though I believe in the program, if the school system says they don't want it, then we shouldn't have it, there's no question. But if, conversely, if they say they do, we should figure out a way to make sure that it's safe and effective. That's all I'm saying. So let's give the school system a chance, as we said we would back in March, to come up with where it is that they are, and then let's work with them on how to make that happen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And let me just say that I want to exactly ditto what you said at the end. If the Board of Ed comes back and says they want to change or need some other system, I would certainly agree with that. But until they do, and, in, and until we hear from them, we haven't even heard from them yet, then I feel that this is not, not uh, the best legislation. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so back in, in the summer when we had this uh, particular uh, conversation, I share with Councilmember Jawando that, <clears throat> you know, as someone who served on the Board of Education for five years uh, and actually presided over that body for two years uh, and was at times labeled a troublemaker because my impetus for running was always and my priority was always to address the issues of disproportionality. Um, so much so that when actually SRO issues came up, I was one of those members who said we need to put breaks and we need to um, come up with uh, a better system in terms of understanding the MOU and the training and all of those things. And so I, I've, I've worked on those issues where we eliminated evening uh, high school, which was identified as a way of tracking students and uh, you know, contributing to the disproportionality, uh, it was it was hard because the, the, the backlash was really fierce. Uh, when we had to make very, very difficult decisions against many who would push back in the name of, you know, addressing issues of disproportionality, um, I was usually the target, but it was okay because it was doing the right thing. And so what I shared with Councilman Rijuanda at that time was that as a member of the Board of Education, I very much, and all my colleagues on the board, very much um, stood by the sense that we were the ones who made school policy, and we were the ones who had to respond to that. We were an elected Board of Education, and we did not like it when other bodies tried to impose certain things on us, even if we agreed with that. 
And so what I shared was that, you know, out of respect for that tradition uh, of knowing that this is an elected body, I would want, I wanted to wait for the report to understand what do they believe from the perspective of what is in the best interest of the student population and how to best move forward, what do they believe could be some options? Because if we are going to eliminate it, which again, it has, I have not been the champion of SROs, everybody knows that, but if we're gonna do that, then we do need to have something in place to address the fact that there are many parents who do like the SRO programs. There are certain students that actually look up to the SROs when, for example, they're being targeted for gang recruitment. I mean, there are some issues out there that we have to pursue. And I am a, a believer that we can come up with a comprehensive way of rethinking student safety uh, in our schools. And so I am very open to that. And this is what I shared. I said, you know, yes, students are not in the school. So it, it is a good time for everybody to have um, a little bit of um, a breather, if you will, to take a look at what could be. Um, and once we get that report, then we can come together and rethink and shift focus, um, which I think it's a wonderful thing that, that we should be able to do. Um, so I was surprised to see this being introduced right now because, the, of course, the school system has not yet, the Board of Education has not yet released their report. Um, you know, they will soon. Um, I would love to hear, you know, what people like the Street Outreach Network uh, would want to say. I would like to know how we can come up with an alternative. What I saw in the bill, I, I, you know, to me, that just doesn't seem very well thought out in terms of what we could use that money for, or what could be the replacement. So there's a lot that needs to happen, which I'm sure now it will during the deliberation. But I just want to be on record again uh, to say that, you know, we could very well come up with an amazing um, alternative. Uh, but to just get in front of the Board of Education and completely dismiss their role, to me, is a mistake. And I don't care that, you know, oh, it's our program because we fund it. You know, the bottom line is that it is their schools. And we have to also recognize that the school-to-prison pipeline and this proportionality issues will not go away just because we ended up eliminating the SRO program. And so we have to level set the expectations because there's a lot of more work that needs to take place. Uh, so I look forward to the Board of Education's report. I look forward to, you know, working again together. I think we've done some incredible work, um, the council in collaboration with, you know, the executive, the school board, with our partners in the community to come up with innovative initiatives uh, very quickly and under a lot of duress. Um, so I have no doubt that we can come up with a, an important uh, approach that doesn't necessarily have to include um, the police officers per se. But for that, I believe that we need to take a step back. We need to be deliberative. And we need to understand that it's a school system of 160 plus thousand students. Um, and these issues of public safety, uh, school, you know, student safety, et cetera, all of that, we need to figure out how do we best provide that while eliminating opportunities for disproportionality and again, I'm hopeful that we can get there. But um, but as I said in the summer, I would like to wait for the Board of Education to say their piece, and then we can from there take it um, and work together. And I don't think we're, we know we have time uh, again. Uh, so so you know we'll we'll see where we go from this. But I just want to be on record again in terms of of um, my position and my experience having served on the Board of Education for those six years. Uh, and, and knowing that uh, ultimately these issues of disproportionality are run very deep. Uh, and uh, regardless of what we do here, we will have to continue to work on those. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Member Uh Thank you, Mr. President. Again, having a well-timed meltdown downstairs, so please bear with me. Um, you know, this is an emotional issue. We, we have discussed this now. This will be the third time. Uh, just in the last few months, and 
as has been stated, I certainly associate myself with those of my colleagues that would have preferred until we had let the process run its course, which is being facilitated by the Board of Education, which includes multiple conversations and interviews with key stakeholders, looking at best practices around the country. It's a comprehensive analysis of where we are right now with this program. And I am open to, as others have stated as well, a transition of some sort, because I'm not sure that this is the best answer or that this is the best solution. But the point is, I don't know. And I do have, as I've stated before publicly, a connection in that as the former director of the Recreation Department, and even before that, I used to be a youth development worker who worked with gang-involved youth when I worked at the Latin American Youth Center. And I worked primarily in Langley Park for several years and saw firsthand the unbelievably complex and difficult and hard to imagine circumstances that some of our students find themselves in, some of which involves gangs, some of which involves other levels of criminal behavior. And as a frontline youth worker, there was no way that I was going to be able to address those issues on my own and did work with law enforcement in numerous instances and the students who were being impacted by this in a way that was productive and helpful and help squash beefs and help de-escalate violence that in some cases had led to previous murders. And so I am very sensitive to wanting to make sure that we are deliberate and thoughtful in how we approach this because there does need to be some level of school security. There does need to be some level of positive interaction with law enforcement and a definitive partnership so that in those instances that Council Reamer, Reamer, you mentioned, where there are severe and nobody would disagree need for police intervention. Just at Clarksburg High School two years ago, there was a student that brought a ghost gun and was had a manifesto and was going to shoot teachers and fellow peers. And yes, it was a school resource officer who helped de-escalate that situation who was familiar with the layout and the geography of the school, was familiar with the administrators, and even had a relationship or knew of this student who was troubled. And so I, I think that we have to be careful as we transition in some form or fashion in ensuring that we do it in a thoughtful way. And that's why I felt the introduction of this bill now is somewhat premature. Now, having said that, I have grown to have a great deal of respect in the last two years for the county council legislative process. The committee sessions, the opportunity to meet from different stakeholders. We have phenomenal staff that will continue to conduct due diligence. Susan Farag, who leads our public safety committee is among the best of the best. And so I'm confident that as we go through this process and more information becomes available, including the information from the Board of Education that will be in a better position to make a decision on what to do moving forward. But this is a very volatile time right now. It's emotional uh, on a lot of different levels. It's complex on a lot of different levels. And I think we as a body need to be cautious and thoughtful and yes, facilitate the discussion, yes, make difficult decisions, but do it with the best information available, not just national data, which is relevant and important, but local data, local information. And I co-sponsored a bill that we just introduced 45 minutes ago that will head us in that direction, which systemically I think will help us moving forward as we make not only decisions about SROs, but a variety of other issues within law enforcement as well, as we look at uh, criminal justice reform. So. Uh, I, I, I think this will be an important discussion uh, and I look forward to it on some level, particularly as we gain more information. And I just want to make sure that we are, we, we do a very broad outreach to ensure that all voices are heard here um, because there are a number of voices that need to be heard. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Council President, and I look forward to this discussion in January. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Reamer. Thank you so much. Good discussion. 
um, I think there's more common ground here, you know, than it might appear. Um, and I, I want to just say on the timeline of this bill, you know, uh, we could have introduced this legislation earlier in the summer that would have put the legislative process ahead of the BOE. I, I felt good about introducing it this time because we could hear from the BOE during the normal course of working on the legislation. I, I do feel that the police department is our accountability at the end of the day and public safety is our accountability. And I think, you know, only the party that is, that really owns it, I think, um, uh, you know, is responsible. So, but what I wanted to say, I think somewhat, you know, in the spirit of what council member Albernos and, and Navarro were, were speaking to, the reason why I think this bill is so important is I think there's a lot of inertia here. And as I have dived into this issue, it, the complexity has impressed me. The, the, you know, our, all of our desire to have trusted adults to use tools like the Street Outreach Network, every path that I've gone down, there are more questions and, and more challenges. And in order to really build a system that can achieve the goal here of creating diversion and support for students, preventing incidents from happening, responding them to, an, to them in a different way. We obviously have to go far beyond withdrawing SROs. We have to build something new and substantial and better. And I think at the end of the day, it is our school system that best is positioned to do that with support from HHS and you know rec and other programs but it is fundamentally our school system and that is why i think we as a council have to stand up and send a message that we want change we want big change and we want the institutions to take on a heavy lift because this is a big heavy lift and there's no easy answer and we don't, we're not going to find even the answers in a few meetings of the committee what we're going to i hope say is there's a different direction that we want to go in and we're going to start a process of building something bigger and, and more more effective and better for our children. And so it's, it's, it's with that spirit that I take this on. And I feel that it's important for us to support this so that we start that in motion. And I think if we don't, then I think, unfortunately, the status quo will persist. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Juwando. Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate the discussion as well, and, and, the, and we'll have continued discussion. Um, as I said, I think people are coming to this uh, from places of genuine, all of us, of care and concern about our community and our students. You know, I've dedicated much of my professional life to these set of issues around criminal justice reform and education policy in particular uh, as a civil rights lawyer uh, and, and as a student in MCPS. Um, and I, I'm going to tell you that we do need to hear from every voice, uh, but the voices of students uh, have, have not been heard to the level that they need to be in this process. Um, and I, I'm going to tell you, I, I talked to a lot of students and I did it before I was elected and after. The vast, vast majority of students uh, either don't, don't have a relationship with the SRO, don't feel that they keep them safe, or in the worst scenarios have had a bad or multiple bad interactions or are scared. Right. And those are all different issues and have different complex problems and, and, and approaches to them. I do think it is a good goal. And much of what I've tried to do here, uh, not only here, but before, is to improve police community relations through established rules and trust and transparency and resources and, and, and the like. And we'll continue all that important work. But I think the importance and the role that we need to play is to uh, eliminate the disproportionate harm. No one, I don't know no one, but many of us didn't have police in schools growing up. And, and when I went to school in the 90s, crime was much higher than it is now. Is, and, and I think that we, we have to pull back and, and resist the temptation to say that this, that's the way we're going to solve it. And I'm not saying that we're all saying that. There is a path forward that doesn't require law enforcement to be a daily presence at schools. And, and, and in the face of the data, all of the data I mentioned at the top is local data. All of that juvenile justice data, all of the arrest data, the, the types of offenses, all of that is local. We had two students uh, speak earlier 
um, uh, this today about uh, some very devastating experiences that they have had and their family members have had with law enforcement in Montgomery County. And I agree that it's not just the school building. That is a fraction of the issue, um, but it shouldn't be a, a further gateway. Um, and it should be a place of safe haven uh, where trusted adults that have the skill set uh, and are trained to interact and support students as their primary mission. That's what we should be funding and supporting. And that's what, that's what this is about. Um, I know we can get there. Uh, I think we will get there. I will say uh, as a member of the education committee and I just, I've had many conversations with school board members and the superintendent. Uh, I do not expect this presentation of here's what we think we should do on January 28th when they come back. Uh, and here are what, here, that's not the role they're taking. That's not the presentation they're going to have. And now whether the school board members themselves push it in that direction, you'll have, they'll have to see. But either way, I think we would be doing them a great service. And this is not without uh, uh, information that I have a great service to allow them to focus on the what's next, which we have all talked about is important. Uh, and we can fund that and we can give ideas and work with them. And I've done that and continue to do that. We, we, I think we did a very smart effort today uh, with the three appropriations that we put forward uh, to start to suggest some proven strategies based in research that will help students both now and when they go back to school eventually. So I think we've started this process and that's what this goal of this bill is. And uh, I look forward to the continued uh, conversation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Rice. So Council Member Juwando, you know, I'm not gonna be disrespectful here, but I've been uh, chair of this committee longer than you've been on the council. Let me just tell you that when it comes to uh, the conversations with our school board and superintendent who I talk to all the time, I do not get that. Um, and so again, I just take umbrage with you laying on uh, descriptions of positions that these folks are having that they're not espousing to me as chair of the education and culture committee, nor have they been things that they've ever said were concerns uh, in all the time that I've been on the education uh, and culture committee. So again, um, let's just get down to the facts. Let's talk about what's there. Let's not put words in people's mouths. Let's just go off of what we know and try and come up with a solution. Again, I do don't like the fact also that we continue to argue about whether or not um, children are for or against SROs. You know that I've been in schools uh, all throughout, just as you have, born and raised here in Montgomery County. In Montgomery County Public Schools have children who went through Montgomery County Public Schools who are still in Montgomery County Public Schools who have friends who like their SROs and love them. I've done videos on them uh, and talked to them and talked to individual students about their interactions with school resource officers and why they like them so much and value them. So again, let's not try and play tit for tat and try and say, oh, well, I have more, or I have less or whatever the case may be, because like I said at the beginning, for every single student you show me, I can show you one as well. Let's not go down that road. Let's go down the road of trying to figure out how we best build a system that works for everyone involved to ensure that the issues that you care about and I care about, which are the same, they are the same. The safety of our students and to make sure that we don't have students whose rights are negatively impacted, who aren't, uh, do, who don't have negative experiences by having a member of law enforcement who may be around them, uh, whether it be on campus or in their hallways, whatever the case may be. There's no one who wants any of those negative things to happen. We're all on the same page. So from that perspective, can we please stop getting away from, oh, well, I'm so right and let's talk about what needs to happen and move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Albernaz. Uh, well, just my last thought is, you know, obviously that this is a specific issue, but um, we can't look at it in a vacuum, right? So the underlying issues that led to those 137 arrests, some of them uh, may or may not be inappropriate. We, we're absolutely gonna dig into those numbers, but the unique and complex needs of a lot of our students are part of what's a lot of what's going on here. Uh, and so I appreciate that the appropriations were introduced along with this specific legislation, but because I think that is a good faith effort to at least initiate that discussion. 
But as we talk about the SRO program individually, you can't not talk about those underlying and complex issues that you know, lead to so many students having such different reactions and such different relationships with those officers. And so while this is gonna be viewed, you know, obviously within the lens as it should be of education and culture and public safety, there are some elements of health and human services here too, a lot of them. Uh, and those interventions I think are really important uh, and, and have to be considered within the context of the solutions that we want to come up with, and we got to go way further upstream. And that involves not just support for students, it involves support for families. Uh, and so, um, and moms and dads. So I, I, I think there's there's a lot here. Uh, and, you know, th this is just a preview of what's to come. I, I think that we do need to be cautious in our rhetoric and how we go about this discussion. I have found a lot of this discussion to be incredibly helpful and the right tone. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of passion from incredible organizations that are out there that have already started the text messages, that have already started the calls, that have also already started the social media campaigns, um, pr pushing us aggressively to enact this legislation as soon as possible. And to those folks who I have a great deal of respect for and admiration for, I, for one, want to make sure that we go through a very important and thoughtful and subjective process. And unfortunately, our students are not going to be back in schools anytime soon. And so this is a good time for us to be having this conversation. But I think, you know, let's let us have that conversation uh, and let's do it thoughtfully. Um, and, and again, include those stakeholders and those students who may have a differing opinion on this bill. Uh, and why. So thank you. Uh, and, and there will be a lot more discussions about this. Um, and I appreciate uh, the, the conversation and I appreciate serving with all of you as always. Thank you, Mr. Council thank President. Thank you, Council Member Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. My last comment about this is the following. I'm the only woman serving on this council and we have an all female board of education with the exception of the SMOB. And I think it's paternalistic to insinuate that our board of education needs help or a little push in order to make a difficult decision. These are extraordinary leaders, elected women leaders who are not shy about making difficult decisions. And they will take into consideration whatever it is presented to them, they will evaluate this, and they will take a very good close look at what is in the best interest of our school buildings and they will make a determination. And we owe them the respect, we might disagree, but we owe them the respect of allowing them to come up and present and, and release whatever decision it is that they have. And then we can take that into consideration, hopefully after a very you know, robust conversation, and, and Council Member knows this right, HHS needs to be a part of this, regarding how will we then how will we then envision and or provide the appropriate support, security and safety to our students that does not promote disproportionality? I think we can do that, but I am absolutely, completely opposed to the notion that for some reason, the Board of Education, all these amazing, very intelligent women need cover from us. That does not make any sense. Again, on the one hand, we can't say that we need to do this, but then let the school system determine what is in the best interest in terms of the programs that follow. It's contradictory. So I just have to say that because it is not easy to be a woman in these positions, okay? And when I start hearing this over and over again, it really does get on my nerves. Let's give them the respect they deserve. Let's allow them to release the report and then we can come back. We're not in a rush. We don't have to deal with our budget until March. There is no rush here. And like it was said, I don't think our, our students are going to be going back to school, unfortunately, anytime soon. So we have time to allow them to do their work, for us to deliberate, and then work together on making a proposal. We've done this before. We did it with the Kennedy Cluster Project. We have, you know, established extraordinary protocols for interagency and departmental collaboration in the best interest of our students and in the best interest of our families. 
we can do this. But to just, you know, kind of rush it, to just get a few headlines, I'm sorry, that is not right. And to disrespect the Board of Education like this, that is not right. So that's what I have to say about this again. I think that we can come up with something very, very productive here. And I've said it from the very beginning, I am committed to doing that. Absolutely. Okay. But to do this in this manner and to position it in this manner doesn't make sense to me, given the fact that we have a process that we have said since this summer that we could very much pursue and very much, I think, end up in a really great place. So that's all I have to say. Again, I look forward to the deliberations. I hope, again, that, you know, we can get this done and that hopefully we'll have the necessary resources because it will take a lot more than these $3 million to come up with something that makes sense for our students. I am committed to fight, you know, for that. Absolutely. Um, but there is a process that I think we can follow and I think we should. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, this bill is now introduced. That was Bill 4620. Uh, we have a tentative public hearing scheduled for January the 12th, 2021 at 730 in the evening. And with that, we are going to adjourn. Thank you all very much for being here. Nineteen bus riders should check should check the status of their usual.